We'll call this 8.30 a.m. meeting to order of the Pinellas County Tourist Development Council for April 20th, 2022. Uh, let's have a roll call. Let's start uh, with Mr. Williams. Good morning, Chuck Price of the Birchwood, St. Petersburg. Doreen Moore, good morning. TRS, Travel Resort Services in the Beaches, Vacation Rentals. Good morning, Frank Hibbard, Mayor of the City of Clearwater. Russ Kimball, Sheraton Sand Key, Clearwater Beach. Good morning, everyone. Steve Hayes, Visit St. Pete, Clearwater. Good morning, Michael Zoss, County Attorney's Office. Good morning, Ken Welch, Mayor of St. Petersburg. Good morning, Clyde Smith, Billmore Beach Resort, Treasure Island. Good morning, Trisha Rodriguez, the Travel Expo Tours in the Clearwater Ferry. Bill Anderson, Starlight Cruises, various locations in Pinellas County. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you being here. We've got uh, a full day, uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, item number three on our agenda is approval of TDC minutes from the March meeting. Are there comments, edits, or a motion for approval? Mo motion by Ms. Moore. Second. Second by the mayor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Show that passes unanimously. Item four, public comments. We do have one member of the public that would like to address the board. Uh, Mr. Hinthorn, if you come to the podium there, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Do I need to hit anything here? It's just on. If you pull it up a little bit closer, we'll be able to. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Hinthorn. I'm the CEO and founder of One Blue Ocean. Uh, it's a nonprofit global ocean organization based here in St. Pete. And I just wanted to address the council. We are getting ready to make an immersive, build an immersive experience, um, and also our creative lab at the factory down in South St. Pete. And I would like the opportunity in the future to show you a little bit more of what we're getting ready to make. Um, we have a team all over the um, world, but we'll be building our central headquarters and stuff here in South St. Pete um, to expand and also build these immersive experiences all over the world. The St. Pete will be our headquarters and home base. And I don't know what the protocol is here, but would love to show you a little bit more in the future, maybe get, get some time to show you what we're gonna build. Very good, we appreciate you coming by. Um, all our information is on our website okay. as far as the individual members of the board, but certainly if you communicate with, our, uh, with Mr. Hayes here, okay. he can uh, share that information with the entire board as well. Yeah, because obviously there's going to be a lot of tourists coming to this from all over, as well as some economic impact to, to the local St. Pete community. So, And yeah. Mayor Welch, I'm sure, would like to hear more about it uh, happening at the factory. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank I you very much. All right. Uh, the reason we're here today, item number five, fiscal year 2023 budget overview. Mr. Hayes, kick us off. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, hopefully everyone has their budget books all, uh, how many, I forget how many pages are in here, but a rather a, a thick document which covers our budget for fiscal year uh, 23. Um, going through the process today, uh, we're going to go through and start off with our revenue projections from Mr. Abernathy from the Office of Management and Budget. Then move to capital project funding and then the department overview. So, um, and then we'll, we'll finish up. So I'm gonna have Jim come up and talk about uh, revenue projections as we move uh, for next year. Uh, good morning, uh, Jim Abernathy with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I'm here this morning to talk about the uh, estimated or the FY23 budget revenues um, and uh, I guess some of the uh, the capital funding uh, program as well. Uh, for for <clears throat> for FY22, we budgeted. Uh, 67 million dollars or just about 67.1 million dollars in tourist development tax revenue and um, that was 
not knowing exactly how the vaccines were going to work out and how travel was going to return. And we are um, we're on pace uh, with the estimate of 86.1 million or j uh, just over $86 million in tourist development tax revenue in FY22, which is about a $19 million above budget. Um, so, you know, obviously we, uh, we were way under on that, but we were very, being very cautious um, while still allowing uh, the department to do what they needed to do to, to bring the tourists uh, back to the county. Uh, for FY23, we're showing a, a, about a flat revenue at 86.6 million um, in the FY23 request. Uh, that is a 29% increase over the, the FY22 budget. Um, but because 22 is doing so much better than we anticipated, it is pretty flat compared to, uh, to our estimates. Uh, some of the highlights uh, from this, uh, obviously um, each year we budget uh, half of one of the percents to beach nourishment. Um, what that means is that FY22 uh, transfers will be based on a much lower number, uh, but we will um, make up for that those uh, extra collections when we do the 24 budget because we won't know exactly what that difference is until uh, well into the next fiscal year. However, in FY23, um, we are including the half, per, half of the percent, plus we are doing a makeup uh, to, to true up FY21, and we're adding about $1.8 million additional uh, above the half percent uh, value in FY23 uh, for beach nourishment. Um, to, to answer a question that comes up quite often, um, FY23, it'll be $14.4 million per percent uh, at budget. Um, I remember not too long ago when I first started with the CVB that we were, you know, six or $7 million per percent. Um, so, you know, we've probably doubled that and I'd like to take credit for that. Um, <laughs> yes. Before he moves too far. Jim what, Jim, what was the true up on the beach renourishment for FY23? Uh, it's $1,768,490. So that'll be added to FY23's budget. Um, Is it in that 8.9 yes. number? Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. It, that includes the, the, the makeup amount. Thank you. So um, if, we, uh, if we don't have any questions on Revenue specifically, we can go on to the capital program. Just a quick question, Jim, uh, and it's just really titling, but why do we include the fund balance in revenue total? We don't include it in the revenue total. We include it in the resources. Um, so the, the resources, when we budget, we have the beginning fund balance and then we have the revenue, and that gives us the total available resources for the upcoming year. So we can fund our, our FY23 budget with the projected revenue, as well as anything left over from the previous year that may, may be needed. So it's not considered revenue, it's considered um, uh, resources, and it may be just a, a titling on the, uh, on the report itself, but it, um, we, can, we don't consider them revenue, we consider just a resource. But it's in that line item. Yes. Okay. And Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I know this is probably obvious, but let me just ask. The $89 million in reserves, that's a cumulative number, right? <clears throat> which, which $89 million are you referring yeah, to? FY22 budget uh, under major objects near the bottom, second to the last yes. row. Yes, yes. That's, that's total reserves. Um, and uh, operating so, and capital. And you're anticipating adding another, what, 60? Uh, yes, yeah, 63.7 million would be added to the reserves in FY23. Okay, thank you. Total, that's the total amount uh, operating and capital. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, actually, moving a little bit forward, maybe you'll get to this, but. Uh, uh, it looks like you're projecting in 23 estimated 91 million. That's, well, yes, 
Um, the estimate in what you're referring to is on page, I think four. Page four, yeah. It's the, our forecast, and the estimate column on that is at 100% revenue. Okay. Our budget is, is at 95%, yes, so there, there'll, there'll be a difference. <laughs> All right, very good. So the column next to that, the 23 requested, requested is, is what's at, yes. Mr. Chairman, just a question. Jim, as I look at the interest earnings over the last four or five years, a lot of fluctuations. With greater balances, we're forecasting roughly $158,000 less in interest. Yes, and, and that's more of a timing issue because when we started this process, um, it was before inflation really took off, and the, the, rev or the interest rate projections from various sources was much lower. And we got into the process. I didn't want to change it now uh, because there are a lot of other people who are doing their budgets and we're trying to get everything tight so that we can come up with a, a good budget for request. But that's going to increase because uh, interest rates have, are climbing as well as our, our balance is climbing as well. So that it's, it'll increase, but it's not going to drastically change um, you know, the, the budget overall or it's not going to impede the operations. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, so on the, um, the capital funding program, that is on page, um, page five of your, of your book. Um, I'm looking at a different version, so my page numbers are not the same. Um, as you can see, we don't really, we don't have any committed capital projects at this point, uh, other than our continuation of the local match for the beach renourishment projects, uh, as well as um, the Florida Holocaust Museum, which uh, was approved a, a few years ago, uh, but because of delays in the construction, they have not been able to complete that project. So we're pushing that out another year to FY23 um, for a possible completion. Uh, so that's not new funding, it's just funding that is rolled over from year to year. Uh, so it's, you know, while it's been in there uh, for the last few years, we have not paid out on it, and it will just continue uh, in there. Um, at hold, the hold on, Jim. We yes. have a question. Um, Jim, on page five, when we talk about the capital funding program, we still have things that are paid for, and I would assume retired. I'll use the uh, the the Blue Jays um, spring training at forty, almost forty-two million dollars. At what point do these? <laughs> fall off of reports. They, they can fall off at any point. This is more of a uh, historical document so that we can we can continue to see what we've done with the program. Uh, it's not in there for any other reason, just to remind everybody that um, these are the projects that we've done in the past. I mean, it's easy enough to take them out of a spreadsheet. It's just as, serving as a historical document at this point. Thank you. That's good. And, um, Something that was brought up to me because it was uh, someone who had looked at this for the first time is at the top under existing obligations, I still have the Dolly and uh, the Philly spring training. And those are for the old commitments that we had. Um, it was like two and a half million dollars for the Dolly that we've paid off and uh, just under $12 million for the city of Clearwater for their, uh, their spring training facility uh, the first time around. Uh, it is not meant as a placeholder for the Dolly or spring uh, Philly spring training agreements that are still in the works. So those would be new projects with new funding uh, at whatever point those agreements uh, are reached. Thank you, Jim. This, this might be and might not probably won't be able to be answered, but we we have carried forward on the potential future commitments for capital funding. Um, the Dali Museum at 17 and a half million um, and we now have a very exciting Center for the Arts that's been discussed in that general area. Does that supersede DALI? Can you talk about how that might impact what they want to do? Um, and if you can, I understand it's not, might not be time to discuss anything there. So you're looking my way, Chuck. Um, so, so we're meeting with the DALI board tomorrow. 
uh, on my discussion so far is that it works with that arts concept um, so they would move forward with this existing request from the TDC but that larger arts complex it, it works with that and so uh, that's the vision so far thank you very much yep. so we can still keep that in the foreseeable future for well for hopeful if, funding mayor well of course there's been a lot of inflation since this 17.5 so I anticipate that bumping up a little bit but uh, I anticipate them continuing that this request well, and the, it's, it's got to be, I mean, I don't say a total redesign, but a significant redesign since they were going to go into the existing parking garage. And now that design I saw on the paper the other day, that parking garage disappears. We'll get clarification tomorrow. But uh, in discussions with Hankine and, and their board, this solves the debate with the Grand Prix. Grand Prix is good with this new concept. And it does address part of the short-term parking problem. But I think there are some other ways we can address it. As you may have heard, I think we've got other uh, land in the area that might serve to deal with that. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I don't want anybody to laugh at me when I ask this question, but even though we don't know an amount, I don't seem to see the raise on this list as a reminder since we've got all of these other things, and I think it should be there. Well, the raise haven't asked. Um, these others have, have submitted an application, uh, which is, those are the basis for the numbers that and, we've And used. I appreciate that, but so, well, I mean, we, we all know it's coming, but I mean, I think we should be transparent about it. At least we think it might be coming. I think it might show good faith as well. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I knew it would come up sometime today. And um, the discussions with, with the Rays are going really well. Uh, and this is the one venue where I can talk with the, the chairman about it uh, and because we're talking about TDC funds. But, you know, first we've asked them to come back to the table and put St. Pete and Pinellas, you know, officially back in the game. They've done that. Uh, I think we've got a lot of potential, but a lot of challenges uh, as well. You know, we're talking about a billion dollar plus stadium. So there's some limits to how much we can invest. but. If everything works out well and we can come to an agreement, you know, I see that being several years out. So, you know, the ask is still there that we reserve, you know, a commitment from the TDC and the county to help fund that stadium. But it's at least two, three years out before we need that. But I don't know what kind of place. Thank you for the update. And I'm, yeah. again, I knew we wouldn't know an amount, but I, I just feel like it's. Um, we all know that it's, I mean, I just think for transparency, we should at least list them. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, to clarify, we, we've talked a lot about that penny uh, when that six cent was added uh, years ago, but there's been no formal request from the city or from the team to the county in any way, shape, or form for that funding. Phil? I agree with the mayor that we need to keep at the back of our mind that it's there. And I'll expand on that later today when I propose something different. But we've got to keep it in mind that the, that ask may be there, and we would want to try and support, make it work if we could. But um, it isn't formal yet, so it shouldn't be on here. I agree, but we all need to keep it back if I have that. That may be coming soon. Yeah, it, it's it's in the front of my head on on this, and you know, it it is something that we know may be coming, and. If it does, then it will be, it'll show up in, um, based on the numbers that they submit to us. Um, you know, we're not hiding anything. We're, I mean, mm -hmm. we're laying out all the funds that we think are going to be in there um, through FY30. Um, so, you know, there's, there are a lot of, a lot of various um, proposal, proposals out there. And um, this is just showing what we, what we've agreed to in, in principle, because with the, um, you know, the, the Dolly and the Historical Society, and I believe the Phillies, we've agreed in principle to these projects. We just have to finalize the, the agreements and the amounts. Um, so, you know, we can shift those up from the bottom to the, to the top and get those into the budget. Mayor? And, uh, and just to follow up, trust me, I know you know it's, and maybe it's just an asterisk with a note like you have on other things. You know, I just, I think their name needs to be here. I think it sends a strong message. 
and uh, you know. Mayor. Yeah, and just to be clear, that the ask will be coming. There's no way that we can fund a stadium without the the TDC support, and we've talked about a penny. And the chairman is right. We basically had a verbal kind of nodding of heads over the years and no formal commitment from the commission, but we will be asking for that formal commitment um, in the near future. And, and those that have been on this board for a while, uh, last time I chaired this in 2016, that was why we front loaded. We didn't spread the, uh, the Blue Jays or the aquarium or Ruth. We didn't spread those over years. We paid those in two or three years mm -hmm. so that when we got to 2019, 2020, we, we would be ready for that request from the raise. Uh, here we are in 2022, um, kind of looking at the same thing as we look at these other projects and that we would want to do that. And typically on any of these projects, we're not the first million dollars or $100 million in, we're the last $100 million in. And that's what I would anticipate us being with any stadium project. So it, you know, it would be in that 25, 26, 27, 28 for the next 20 or 30 years after that. So, Mr. Henderson. All right, I'm going to opt in to go ahead and since it's on the forefront. Um, last month we talked about beach nourishment and I was satisfied that there's enough in beach nourishment to carry us forward as we go and we could always adjust and, and add more if we needed to. But on down the road, if these funds get consumed by something much bigger, that money might not be available in capital. So I would propose that we do an increase to beach nourishment now, which if it builds up too much, we can always divert it back to the general capital. Um, we can't do the other, we can't do the opposite if it's not there. Uh, there are projects, uh, pretty much every beach south of Clearwater Beach has sand issues. And Clearwater Beach doesn't have a sand issue, but it has uh, infill in the bay. Uh, uh, and that's gonna be a big problem. It's gonna be more dredging and so forth. We dredge it out, we put it at the hotel site at the foot of the Sand Key Bridge. They've added tea groins and just recently with boulders out there and taking all that sand and put it out there and created their own beach and it's gonna stay there because of the tea growings. Um, John's Pass, I you know, have a personal issue with that. They, they uh, put uh, left debris there from the bridge construction that created something like a growing and that's what's caused the problem that we have there now where the sand is, is building up under the bridge and around the west end of the boardwalk and that's gonna to continue to grow unless it's addressed. It is being addressed. They're doing studies, they're working on it and I appreciate that. But there are probably some smaller projects and, and, and uh, as more studies get done, maybe there'll be a, a longer term solution. They can figure out that the growing's worked in Reddington and, and maybe it can work somewhere else as well. But I'm concerned about that elephant in the room, so to speak, that, that's gonna want a lion's share of uh, this capital dollars for several years. And I think we need to preserve uh, our beaches um, I was going to wait till later when we see some reports from advertising and so forth. Uh, certainly, uh, museums, culture, um, art galleries, stadiums, sports complexes, they all add to what we have here. But our number one is the beaches. We can't lose sight of that. And we need to make sure our beaches are always in great shape and are always inviting. And that's the number one reason uh, people come here. Um, we get a, a, a competitive advantage because we have so many other things to offer on top of our beaches compared to other beach communities. And that's great. But we can't lose sight of the fact that our number one asset is those beaches out there. And the better they look and the stronger they are and the more consistent we have maintained them, the better off we're going to be in the long run. And as I say, if we move money, more money into that fund now and it comes, we've got just so much in there that we're not using, then we can always shift it back. But if we're only taking a half percent every year and the time comes that we need more, but somebody came along and made this long, we made, agreed to make this long-term commitment to something we all want to have, and now we can't have the beach nourishment money. We've got to find it somewhere else, and that might have to come out of marketing then, and we don't want to do that either. So I would propose that we raise the beach nourishment to 1%, from half percent to 1%. And as I said, if it accumulates too much and we can't spend it or we don't need to spend it, then we can divert it back. Just as if we said last month, well, if we need it, we can always get more from capital. We can divert it like we're doing now. We're making up for uh, what should have been a half percent by putting it in this budget. Um, I don't know what everybody else feels about that. I don't know if there's some negotiation there, but I really feel pretty strongly 
and I think you all agree, that our number one asset is the beaches. And the advertising and marketing studies that they've done and we've seen show that, that it's far and away the most important reason people come to this area. Mr. Prather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Phil, I couldn't uh, agree 100% more with you that, that the beaches are the number one draw. The reason we're all sitting here, we went from 50 to, to 75 million in tax revenue. Now we're talking at 90 million. So um, <coughs> now is a time when we can afford it. Is there a, a, an open in the dialogue, opening the dialogue to uh, put a sunset on that? If we take it to 1% for the next five years to build that capital up, and then it sunsets, and then uh, the board can discuss whether they want to maintain that uh, additional half cent. Um, that way, we we have a plan in place, um, and maybe it's not five. Maybe you would argue for ten years in the future for the I, full cent. I think that putting any kind of straight. I understand where you're going with it, but I think that putting any kind of constraint like that may be perceived as automatic at a certain point, and. Uh, if it sunsets, then we got to reallocate. Do we still need it? Whereas if we just leave it open-ended and do a 1% like we have, we can always, as a board, who's ever serving on this board, can make that decision that, okay, we can divert some of this money over and continue to accumulate 1% should we need it in the future, should something else change beyond all of us. Um, so, you know, I understand what you're saying there so that you could kind of plan on, okay, that's going to sunset, it's going to go away, but what if we need it? And we sunset it and we needed it, and now we've made commitments on the fact that that's going to sunset. So I think that we really just need to, to increase that fund and we need to spend it appropriately and sooner because there are issues up and down the beaches right now. As I say, not just beach nourishment, but removal of sand that, that affects our waterways. You know, I know a, a, a cruise operation is less important than the beaches themselves, but when that sand flows in and it opens up under a bridge, the, the current opens up and the sand settles there. And it's been a problem in Clearwater they spent a lot dredging and it's filling all back in again because, uh, you know, they put the jetty in at the north end of San Key 50 years ago. And at that time, Russ, I don't know how much beach you actually had. You had a seawall that's, you know, so far. I didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> I know, but, but, but how much sand accumulated there because it's all moving that way and they put the jetty in to keep it from going to the pass. And now it's filled all the way up, so now it's going to the pass again. And uh, you know, so things have changed a little bit there, but you know, I think the Clearwater Beach itself has enough sand to last for years and years, the way the things flow. The, the problem in Clearwater is gonna be the bay's gonna fill up. <laughs> and it's all of the sand that we're putting into the, to the South County and the Reddington and Indian Rocks and Indian Shores, all that sand moves up and it falls into Clearwater Pass and it doesn't go back out. So I'm not an expert at it. I've just seen what I've seen over the last 40 years in this area and uh, yeah, I, I will get more personally involved with it. I need to, you know, we, uh, I was on a first name basis with the previous person. We did get a presentation a couple months ago and that was good to hear. But uh, I need to get more personally involved in it because it, it does affect my operation, but it also affects all of us as far as the, the quality of life and our waterways and so forth. And it's gonna be an expense. So that may be an area we could spend some of that money to, to uh, find sand by taking it out of the van, put it back on the beach. But more importantly, we need to figure out how to keep it on the beach. And when we approach a, a permanent solution or a more permanent solution, then we can ease back at that point. I'm also concerned that, that, that H word that someday we're gonna, you know, we've had some recently, but we haven't had a, we haven't had a catastrophic yet. And if we get a catastrophic blow, then a lot of those beaches are gonna get wiped out. And we're gonna need that money then. So it's just something we've got access now and I'd like to see it preserved for something that we need the most, possibly need the most in the future to maintain our competitive edge. Mayor Welch. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with uh, Phil on, on most of those points. Um, the, the uncertainty of not only a hurricane, but sea level rise and all those issues uh, are gonna go well beyond our ability to fund anything uh, by ourselves. But I do agree with um, the need to invest in beach renourishment. And you know, it's never been, um, suggested here that any one project, the Rays or any other, would you know, consume most of that 40%. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we can invest more, as you recommend, and still fund a potential Ray Stadium if we come to an agreement. Um, 
we've, we are in a, a great position. As I'm looking at page five, the FY30 forecast leaves us at $307 million um, in fund balance, and our capital commitments are about 60. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. So we're looking at a quarter of a billion dollars um, yep. in surplus that we can apply strategically. Um, and so I'd like to see, you know, the model for how we increase beach renourishment. I don't know if we carry over those funds or expend it all every year. So is there a balance? Yes. Uh, the last time I checked, it was a handful of months ago. It was about $26 million was in the beach renourishment uh, portion of the capital projects fund. So it, it, that, that, is ex, that is outside of this fund. So It doesn't appear on this page. No, it does not. Okay. And so just, you know, agree on what the need is going forward, but, you know, I agree in investing that in a way that's strategic. The other thing I'll throw on the table, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you're ready for proposals, but Phil kicked it off. Um, we've talked for many years about the need to, for us to support the arts uh, to a higher degree. Uh, there have been summits, countywide summits. I uh, was looking last night in 2017, there was a countywide summit out at, um, uh, what's our western, <laughs> I'm having a brain cramp. Where's the museum? The James. Botanical Gardens. Botanical Gardens, yeah. Wow, I need, this is why I need coffee. A um, couple months off the then, job and you've already forgotten our... <laughs> and then the epicenter, we had a summit. And we have documentation that shows how far we're behind Hillsboro, Tampa, Sarasota, Orlando in funding. And so I would like to propose that we look at funding, and, and my thought was a third of a percent for the arts for five years, which would be about $5 million a year, $25 million for countywide supportive arts infrastructure. Now we fund the big arts facilities, but this, what we've heard was we need to get more dollars down to the artists themselves, um, fund the arts infrastructure. And so I would ask us to take a look at that if, if we've got support for it, make sure we've got the legal basis to do it. Now other counties are doing it, so uh, I'd like to see if we can do the same thing. But we've had requests from the Arts Alliance, Creative Pinellas, um, Clearwater uh, Arts Groups, Dunedin. Uh, they can, all were can I ask you to just hold that thought for one second? Sure. Because we had a list of other folks that wanted to talk about sand, I think. Okay. So but I'll throw that on the table okay. and come back to it. Thank and I don't know sure. if Phil's was actually a motion or a conversation starter, but um, uh, Mayor Brzezowski, please. So I, I like the idea as well. But I think what we want to do, I mean, we had, I think it was Kelly Levy that came and made a, because one of the things under, when she did the uh, presentation, you know, and I'll speak for myself here in Dunedin, you know, uh, Dunedin Causeway has equal, if not more visitors than Honeymoon Island, the number one park in the state. And I know that the state does their own stuff, but Dunedin Causeway, which is managed by the county, um, is losing sand every day and it, and it never gets considered for renourishment. And so, you know, I think, I think what we want to do before we just lop an amount of money and maybe, maybe Kelly can tell us before the actual budget is approved is to have her say, okay, what we don't want them to do is, um, just spend what we give them. What we want to do is ask them, what do they need? What do we need to be premier matching, you know, for the grants that they go? Because that's how she explained it to us. They, they don't just use it. They use it as a, a match to other things. So sometimes it takes longer. Well, maybe do we, are there some projects we need to do without that match so we get them done quicker? Are there areas that don't get addressed? like Dunedin Causeway, it's been there for, since 1958 or 62, I can't remember, and I don't think it's ever been renourished. Um, I can tell you, um, honey, uh, Hurricane Pass fills in terribly, all there by Caledicia Island, again, one of our top 10 beaches in the country. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that, that can go along with what you said, uh, but I don't think we should just add an amount to it. I think what we need to do is ask, 
what do we need? And let's have that dialogue. And it may take a little longer than the budget, like today, but I do agree with where you're going with this. I, I would just like some, like Ken Seltz said, some strategic thought process to this. Um, you know, is it the chicken or the egg? Can she spend what we give her, or it, does she need more? You know, I, I want to know that. We can always spend. Yes, uh, I Mr. Know. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mayor, I agree with you, Phil. I, I support it as well. Um, uh, more to what uh, the mayor just articulated, I think that we need to change our approach and not be reactive to when we see the sand shifting, when we see beaches having problems, let's get proactive. Let's, let's approve the additional funds and then have a plan that enables us to be preemptive to any problems that could come down the road. Um, let's not just react to how the sand shifts. Let's put the plan together and have a, uh, uh, the premier beaches that we tout in our advertising, let's make them even better. And uh, it's a long-term commitment. So I'd be fully supportive, Phil, of, uh, of adding that additional half percent. But do we, want to, do we want to wait, though, and to see what we really need? Because it might be more than that. I, I'm just saying. I don't want to just tap a, a number to it. I want to see what we need. And I, I would like to see us have some, you know, we can have a whole special meeting on it, really. I, I think what we're saying is let's commit that we want to do something and let's create a capital plan that works for the entire county. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's have a separate discussion, I guess, maybe. I just don't want to lob a percent on it to it. I, All right. Ms. Moore? Posing a question, because I certainly am in support of beach nourishment and finding ways to make this more um, economical for everyone involved. But it, the question is, how much control does Pinellas County have of its own issues? We have to work with you know, the Army Corps. We have the federal funds, the matching, all of those things. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't, I don't see that, you know, it's great that we identify, we, we, we know the needs and the locations and the problems and the ongoing problems, and it's always good to be proactive, but how much do we control? So even if we do dedicate these funds, how do we then make sure that they get allocated and it isn't something that you can say we're going to do tomorrow because you have to marshal all of these just like, John's Pass, for example, you know, that's um, a coming together of all of these different uh, federal, state, local assets. And private. So, yep. Yes. Thank you. And we're, we're continuing right now to wait for a response from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as far as the issue on the North Beaches with the easements. Do I see another hand? Mr. Williams? Yeah, just uh, as a follow-up, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the, um, you know, I'm surprised to hear that we have $26 million okay. sitting out there. If we're going to allocate these dollars, let's make sure they spend it. Let's make sure they, they're doing the things proactively to, to get these beaches where they are. With $26 million bucks sitting there, I would believe that there are things we could be doing today that uh, would help. Well, that's, that's why before, our, well, we'll go on. Mayor Hibbard. I'm sorry, Mr. Kimball. Um, the other thing is, Jim, what's the process to change this to some number, uh, first of all, and who is approval after us, and, and is there any uh, beyond the Board of County Commission at all? How is this enacted? Because we haven't done this in well, many, many years. The, the current policy in place, or the plan in place is, um, we dedicate half of the percent each year. So that's part of the budgeting process as we calculate how much one of the percents is worth and we dedicate half to that. Um, you know, it, ultimately it's the, the Board of County Commissioners who, who adopt the budget and you know, we, we try to stick to that half a percent at least, uh, but ultimately when the, the board adopts the budget in September, that's when, the, that's when it takes place. And so this has always been a year-to-year -year yes. commitment. It's not any longer than that ever. Well, it's it's a commitment that's in place, and we follow that each year. But um, you know, the the amount of money that we put each year depends on the projections for the revenue. Right. So it, it, yes, it's a it's a year-to-year -year, um, 
because it's part of the budgeting process, the board has to adopt it each year. But the half percent commitment, is that written down anywhere or is that just protocol? Yes, it, it's written down. Mr. Zoss. Yeah, if I may, just some clarification. By ordinance, half of one of the percents is dedicated. So that's why yeah. that is continuous, it is written down. Um, but the when the plan was rewritten, it was decided that instead of putting that level of detail in the plan, that it would be done by a budgetary function. That's why since <laughs> then, that half a percent is always allocated by budget. So one of the things you could consider if you're considering increasing that amount, you can do that with an annual budget recommendation as well. You don't necessarily have to either amend that ordinance or increase it. That way it gives you the flexibility that you'll still maintain that half a percent every, every year that is budgeted and then you can always adjust it annually. This board looks at the um, budget that's proposed. They can make a recommendation to the BCC to increase it. The BCC can agree or not agree, um, and you can do that annually, or you can make a recommendation to amend the ordinance and increase it to a permanent 1% every year. So just wanted to clarify, I give have you a, some options. I have a second part of the question. Yes, sir. Michael, um, with this, the changes in the statute for that we operate under for, uh, I think it came out of North Florida, uh, what money can be used for, quote, beaches or law enforcement and so forth, can you restate some of those? Because if we're really looking at our beaches and how important they are and all this, and, and I agree to what everybody said, maybe we ought to be looking at a little more identification or a little more structure and in, 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 in what things look like on the county or have funds available to cities to individualize or, or whatever it is, whether on the beach or on the corner of the beach or, or whatever it is. What can we really do more now? Well, a couple of things, uh, Wes, I mean, uh, Russ, excuse me, the um, nuances as far as the statute goes as to law enforcement were for specific counties of a certain population. Right. So that's a little different than what our situation would be. That being said, they're currently in the plan as adopted initially and has re revised several instances, including the current version, limits us to beach nourishment. There's other aspects within that beach park facility, beach nourishment, rivers, kind of cleanup stuff that is not included in our plan that we could do that would that would require an amendment to the tourist development plan, which would be a super majority vote. You guys could recommend that and the board could consider expanding that, um, which would give you a little bit more that you could use the money for as far as some of the issues that I've heard brought up today, potentially. The second piece is that is not in our plan is the public facilities piece, which was added, that allows for certain infrastructure projects that arguably could affect water quality, those kind of beach type issues that we could look at individually to see if whether or not the monies could be expended. Those two, though, would require a plan amendment. Okay, because we need to protect ourselves on one hand, and we need to look at progressing with, with our tourism on the other side. So. That's what I'm trying to make sure we all understand it because we're operate also under, as they've said, the Corps of Engineers and every other department over this also. As far as making a change or doing something more, I think it's a good idea. I got the biggest beach, but I'm, I'm, I get it from South, that's for sure. And it's my property that grows 35 foot a year is what it's done, but it's getting towards the end of the jetty. So that's kind of where we are to give an idea of the growth and, that sand is coming from the southwest and moving northeast. So, uh, but I think we need to address uh, the other parts of the beach and protect ourselves, what we would use it for or not, too. Thank you. Mayor Hibbard. Michael, if we did increase this to 1%, um, whether we do it annually or for a period of time, first of all, is that sinking fund can we invade it if we're not using the money? I think we could draft something that would allow that, so long as it stayed probably on the capital side. Okay. I mean, Phil, I agree with you 100% that the beaches are the number one draw. I don't think anybody can deny that. Um, I also agree with the Mayor Pajowski about the fact that I'd like to really see what's <coughs> forthcoming as far as needs. Uh, and what we currently have set aside. 
I would love to have somebody come in from the outside and talk a little bit further. I've never gotten clear answers on things that we can do to prevent this cycle. You know, we've been dealing with beach nourishment as long as I've been in the city of Clearwater, more in our sand key area. Obviously, Clearwater Beach is, is growing or at least staying status quo. But I understand the Southern Beaches problems, and I certainly understand our dredging issues within Clearwater Bay, which, you know, continue to be an issue. Uh, we seem to just re-nourish and re-nourish and re-nourish. I've never understood why we can't take the sand that's in Clearwater Bay and put it back where it came from, first of all, but I've been told by some of the EPA fo folks and others that we can't do that. It doesn't seem logical to me, uh, especially when we're importing sand from other places that's... Anyway, uh, I, I would like to hear more, though, from experts on how we can spend money that will keep the sand where we want it so that this is not this never-ending cycle uh, that we've been experiencing. Um, there are some other things along the coastline I'd like to see, too. I'd like to see Clearwater Pass between Caledici and Clearwater Point reopened. It would add to our water quality significantly. But um, I would support 1%, but I'd like to do it after we actually have a laundry list of what we're going to be spending the money on and where we are now, again, with getting all the easements, which last time I was in D.C. talking to our senators and congressmen was still in a quagmire. I think, I think we're making a little progress, but we don't have any real new information for you. Mayor Brzezowski. Thank you. And, you know, as I'm just sitting here, and I know we're talking about beach renourishment, um, but then, you know, Russ asked about the other things, right? Steve brought forward at our last meeting a future discussion on what those other things, you know, other things that he was hearing out of our strategic planning surveys and stuff. Um, and, and Mayor Welch mentioned an additional thing for arts. And, and so what that says to me is we have a golden, and we know the race. So we have a golden opportunity here to have a much broader dialogue about all of those things. And, and Kelly and her crew or whomever, the appropriate people, I think could tell us, you know, what our needs are, including broader things that haven't been considered, like, uh, you know, like Dunedin Causeway, which has never been, hap never happened. But, and, and what um, Mayor um, Hub Hibbert is saying, but I think we should have all of those people put some type of something together. Like, it's great that Ken is saying we should contribute to the arts, but what does it do? I wanna know what it does. I, I love the idea, but I wanna know what does it do and, and how it could be done. So somebody's got to make a plan with that, right? I, I would like to know what Ken's going to be, or I'm sorry, Steve's going to be bringing forward. So maybe it's a separate workshop, but this year to say these are our plans so we can have a real, we can have the whole financial picture and see how it affects this. I think that's the better way to do it, but I think we can commit that we want to do those things. Thank you. Mayor Welch. You and your tech. I agree wholeheartedly with Mayor Bulgowski on that uh, approach of, you know, lining up our strategy with the dollars. We're in a great place again. Um, uh, quick math, if we increase to 1%, that's 7 million about a year for eight years. Um, that's still within the surplus we have, doing that and all the capital projects. So again, I want to, um, this is a perfect opportunity, as Mayor Hibbert said, to talk about new ways to, yeah. on how we approach it. It fits right into sustainability and everything okay. we've been talking about. We've got to talk about sea level rise as well and how that will impact our beaches. So I think it's, it's time for that conversation uh, at some point, Mr. Chairman, under your leadership, sir. Thank you. Mr. Henderson, want to wrap this up in a bow? Yeah. 
I would say we defer to the end of the meeting and, and talk about other things that come up. Um, I agree, we need to see it. I'm bringing it up now. I was working towards it the last few months, as you may have seen, and then I backed off last, last meeting because it's only 26 million, that's pretty good. But the truth is there's stuff that needs to be addressed sooner than the channels, and I think that the uh, staff has been, the department's been given the directive, oh, you have to match, use this for matches. Well, there may be some direct spends we can do with that money too. And, and <clears throat> I'm only bringing it up now, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20th year. Uh, my, my fifth term ends in October and uh, I probably want to stay on if, I, if the uh, powers of be will let me, but I may not be here next year. So uh, I thought this was the time to bring it up and say, let's, let's put this at 1% and you want to change that next year, then think about it. But uh, I don't know if we can do that after we have some more dialogue about what needs to be done or what can be done. Um, but I thought I would bring it up now as a half percent increase to a one full percent and knowing that we could always divert it back into the general fund if we get too much sitting there. So, I, but I would say that and a uh, proposal by the mayor about, you know, a third of a, a percent going to arts. We can listen to the presentations and, and look at everything else and toward the end of the meeting when we're ready to really solidify the budget, let's, let's bring it back up and look at all the different pieces. Mr. Kimball. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, in 2016, another topic that we discussed probably was uh, amateur sports and, and investing in sporting facilities other than Major League Baseball or spring training. And uh, we've had re reports a little bit, but not a lot. And I think this is along with the arts. I think that this is a topic that needs to be uh, addressed, reported to, and where we go forward on it, whether how our commitment is, I don't know. It adds rooms to hotels and to collect more tax of those that are not on the beach. And along US 19 and Feather Sound and, and some land that we have in different spots, when Clearwater put in another three more, and I think it's on the, up here how much we spent, uh, $500,000 for three more fields, um, it just changed the whole world on fast pitch softball. And, and so things like that, I think we need to be looking at, and it needs to be on this list also, please. Okay. Thank you. And we did, we did res, uh, subject to the governor's veto, there is $15 million in the budget this year for looking at remediation efforts at Toy Town with the goal of amateur sports at that location. Um, whether $15 million is enough to cut the grass there, we don't know yet, but uh, that's in the state budget. We'll see what happens with that. But it was the speaker's uh, priority to that it go towards some sort of youth sports complex there. Uh, you've read probably about the proposal for the facility in Largo um, for amateur sports. The same gentleman who was proposing the one in Tyrone and St. Pete that didn't make it through is proposing a similar project in Largo. Um, from the renderings, I didn't see any hotels on site. There's some nearby, but not a lot nearby. So. There's a lot of stuff happening, but you're absolutely right. That is a key issue for us to continue to look at, especially if um, the rays don't go or the rays don't stay and we need to look at another way to um, access those interests. Ms. Moore. Just looking forward and maybe basic budgeting, but I, I, yes, I agree. We need to look at all of these programs, things that we want to bring about but I don't think we should, from a budgetary standpoint, I think we need to be, that's what we're doing in a budget, is forecasting and projecting. So we need to establish the mechanism because we are in a fortunately flush year, um, and, and then work towards those projects in here and, and drill down on it, having, for example, uh, Phil's suggestion about the increase that should it become a surplus that it could be put back into the capital, I think, um, again, I don't, maybe that's not, I'm misunderstanding what was proposed, but I, I think we want to hear all of these proposals, whether it's sports, arts, beach nourishment, um, but be making our plans and our projections to have that in place so that we can implement quickly. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> Mayor? Sorry. I, I just feel like, and we probably, in the future, maybe want to have these conversations prior to putting something on paper, you know? Um, because usually, at least in 
our budgeting world, government budgeting world, we start talking about our budget, you know, in January. Um, you know, what, what are the new capital things we want to do? Um, we, we don't have the dialogue during the actual workshops when you're working on it. You're, you're doing it ahead of time so that you have all that information. Unfortunately, it, it just hasn't worked that way here, and that's fine. Um, but I, I think that dialogue has to happen because I got a feeling that Kelly's going to say she, we need more money than that. And so I don't want to make a change to then make another change. That, that's just, I mean, because it's work for Michael. I mean, there's a whole thing, and it, not even knowing if that, if the 1% is what we need. I, 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 don't, I just feel like that's wasted effort. I think we're all committing that we probably need more, and we have to get Kelly's input and everybody else's input about it. So I just think what we should do is commit verbally that this is what we want to do, and Steve will go do what he needs to do to start collecting that information. Mr. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm taking lots of notes, and one of the things that I've, I've put down is to look at um, between the May and June meeting, which are, I mean, are rapidly coming up, is a one in the May meeting have a presentation on strategic plan, which then talks about some of these issues, which we're, we're talking about. Um, everything from messaging to um, um, uh, it just a, a variety of things. There's like all the stuff's running up in, in my head, but to be able to set the stage for that. Second is to have the conversation, you know, to come back with the appropriate people related to beach nursery. What, what are those things? You know, at least give them the ability. They did give a presentation of what they've done and what's next, but what are the other the possibilities with that? Um, same thing with arts, you know, to be able to go look at that, whether it's through Creative Pinellas. Um, but, you know, again, what are those things that are out there? And then, you know, the overall capital discussion that we're having as well. So I think it all falls in, falls in line. The question, you know, I get, think would be for, from a budget standpoint is you come out of a workshop or a, a, a meeting on these things and say, wow, we really need to do X. Can, or in the budget process, can we still do that? Or is this a budget amendment later on based on recommendations? How, I'm not sure how all that works, but that would be helpful to understand, you know, at, at, as well. Mayor Hibbert. Yeah. I don't know where we are now. So I'm gonna still, get we're back still on page five. something. We're still on page five. I'm going back to page three. <laughs> uh, before Jim sits down and getting off of renourishment for a second. Uh, your assumptions on uh, CPI are 2.8 percent. Is there any need to be altering that? And just from some of the uh, hoteliers, what is the general elasticity with your pricing during these times? Do you have more <laughs> pricing power with your employees being more expensive and your all of your supplies? We we are in beverage? we're in the air of a lot of unknowns. And we've all prospered very well. And, and I think that you're going to start seeing some conversions from these wide open to tighter to operate um, to cost-wise are going up. And you look at gasoline and everything else, what happens here a little bit. And so I think that cost of operating is going up, wages are going up and everything. And I think that rates are going to be coming down are not seeing the growth in them like we have. It's been unbelievable. So I'm not sure it'll go back, but it won't go forward as much and is what I see in that way. Um, and, and it is a little bit interesting when you look around the county at different tax collections and see what the percentage of increases are in some areas versus other areas too. But there's a lot of unknowns, Mayor. Right, but if you can pass on pricing, which you're saying, I'm hearing you're saying your margins yeah. are going to get squeezed. Yes. So if but, your prices were continuing to rise, our revenues would continue yes. to rise. Yes, but right. I think it'll be a You don't think that's going to happen? I think it'll happen at a slower rate than where we've been the last year and a half. Right. You comfortable with 2.8? 
I am comfortable with 2.8 because it's based on a year from now. So it would be an additional 2.8% from where we are now. So it, the, the, the CPI increase that's being projected by the Federal Reserve is the prices are going to stay where they are, but they're going to go up a little bit as they were before. And this is a moving target. You know, it's, um, I wish I could pr project it better, uh, but we use information from the state and from the, the federal government. And, you know, it's, when this is factored in, it's, um, you need to look at where you are now and then add 2.8% uh, to figure out where you, you need to be next year. And it may continue to be higher than that, but the, I haven't seen any uh, projections on, on a, a big, you know, the 7 or 8% that we're seeing now, uh, a year from now. Yeah, the Fed hasn't been really on the money on their projections so far. So that's my world. Mayor Welch, did you have anything else? Did, did you not, want to circle back on? But since, since you're calling me. Um, no, I, 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 the issue of a budget amendment did pop in my head now. Um, have the conversation now. You know, state that we want to investigate those. But I don't think we're stuck with this October 1 time limit to have the plan sketched out. So we can come back with an X amount for beach nourishment based on these projects and this, these facts and data, and the same thing for the arts and sports. So I think as long as we're having the conversation today, we're kind of saying what, what we support going forward. And then I think we need to move through that actual, what are the facts and data and science say? And we haven't had, you know, uh, Mr. Henderson brought up the sand, uh, Mayor Welch brought up arts. Um, we're hearing, you know, we're a re revisit of the sports complex, but the staff who has been working on the budget for a while um, is bringing forward what we have now as far as requests. We talk about the raise, we don't have a request from the raise. We talk about the dolly, we don't have a redo of the dolly. We don't have a redo of the St. Pete History Museum. Um, the Holocaust we pushed off because of timing, but so we have a lot of flexibility. We, like the mayor said, we're not tied into October 1st and we're certainly not tied in to finishing it today. So, uh, Jim, you wanna, Phil, I did see. you have something else or do you wanna go to page six? Just, you know, <laughs> the goal is to bring it up and it seems like we've got a consensus that it's the direction we need to go um, with regard to waiting. I, I would think today we go to one, we, I make a motion to to increase to one percent. If it needs to be more, then we make a budget amendment. If it it turns out to be too much next year, you bring it back down. That way, we know that it's something we're definitely moving forward on. I'd second that. And I assume that would be a motion. To, are you looking as a, a motion to recommend to staff to increase the budget? recommendation to 1% or are you looking for the TDC to recommend to the BCC an ordinance change for 1%? Mr. Zoss, did I get that right? What's well, easier? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the whole point of waiting. We're saying we yeah. want to increase it, but that's the whole point well, of waiting. Just, you know. Ma maximum flexibility would be just to make the budget recommendation and then once you get the data if it turns out that you think one and a half percent needs to be done then you can do an ordinance change to that amount or if you think the one percent moving forward is appropriate or if it's not warranted and just leave the existing ordinance at the half percent and then budget every year one percent so you have options the first thing <laughs> what, what's the first thing what he said <laughs> Flexibility. <laughs> so, Mr. Zoss, would you would you state the motion then? I think the recommendation the motion should be a motion recommending that for the budget this year reflect a full one percent of the um, one of the TDT percents to go to beach nourishment instead of half a percent. And would you be looking at that as a one percent of the current fiscal year budget? or a 1% reflective of including the $26 million, you're looking for an additional 1% going forward forever. In, in, in the 23 budget, instead of earmarking one half percent in the budget process, I would say we earmark mark one full percent for beach nourishment in the budget process. Mr. Williams, you're good with that? All right, there is a motion and a second 
for a budget recommendation. Mr. Welch. Um, taking comments on that? Yes, sir. So I certainly support the goal. I just think it's too early if if we recommend that and the question comes, how are you going to spend it? We don't have the answer yet. That's why I think we need to go to that next discussion about how we actually utilize those funds, especially when we have 26 million there already. If it's something we need to change in terms of our plan, if it's currently only something we can use for matching, then we're going to have to change that anyway. So I just think it's early. I think we, today I'd say I support looking at additional revenues for beach nourishment pending our further discussions on exactly what that means and how we do it. So I won't support that motion, but I support where we're trying to go on it. Further Ditto. comment? Ditto. Further comment? Mr. Kimball. Uh, I agree with the mayor. All right. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll try a voice vote, and then after that, we'll go to roll call. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any, all opposed? No. No. <laughs> All right. So do we have a roll? We have a, a sheet for roll call for votes. No. Nope. All right. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Those opposed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion fails. I oh, when you thought about it. <laughs> All right, Mr. Four. Abernathy, carry on. Um, I think my time has expired. <laughs> uh, I, I'm finished with the uh, with both the revenues and the capital program. Um, I think everything else is the divisions um, within the CVB. If there are any other questions on either the revenue projections for 22 or 23, or the the capital, we, and I don't know if this is yours or someone more in the department on the revenue projections. Uh, we heard before about the, the the we had the jump because of the cruise industry being shut down that we were seeing an uptick during our not typical season um but yet the international markets hadn't completely opened yet and kind of we see some sort of a loss of the cruisers but an increase of the foreign i mean was that all kind of baked into the formula when you were looking at those revenue projections yes at a higher level they were um steve and i discussed where we, uh, you know, what the industry is projecting, and I come in conservative on, on those numbers. It's, um, it's, like I said, it's a, it's a slight increase uh, from the, the estimate. It's a much larger increase, obviously, from the budget, but we were being very cautious uh, for the current fiscal year. So, you know, it, it's, it's a factor. Uh, all those things are factored into the figures we used. Very good. Appreciate your time this morning. Okay. All right, Mr. Hayes, what's next? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and great discussion prior to the department overviews. And before we get to each of the different departments, I kind of want to walk through, Mr. Chair, kind of talking a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, looking at, uh, ahead. Um, so there we go. I think the first thing I wanted to talk about more was area of focus. And, and Mayor Jabowski, this is kind of where we talked about, again, strategic plan. And if you look at these items that are here, it's all things that I've been talking about that we've been looking at. But the real, what's really going to come out of strategic plan is these become more prominent. Um, I'm glad that the fact that we're using data to make our decisions whether it's you know getting input from outside groups on where we need to go, it's looking at things strategically, I think that's critically important. Um, the producing of the strategic plan with key su success metrics, that's really gonna affect things in the next six months, especially when we you know, hear the results that we, we got, not only from stakeholders, but from staff, from the industry, a variety of different things. And um, as we develop that for our work plans going forward, while that may not change monetary decisions, it may change strategic priorities and the things that we're going through and doing. Um, you know, example of being the storyteller, you know, that was one of the things that we heard loud and clear from stakeholders was, you know, the ability to protect the messaging about the beach, but the fact is that we have all of all of these other things. 
And then really the intentional collaboration with internal, external stakeholders and partners, I think is more critical now than ever. Um, in fact, we have a, a current campaign, Unwind to Be Kind, that we have going out in which we're working with um, a variety of different folks, but including Keep Pinellas Beautiful, about how do we protect our natural resources um, and, and keeping our, our areas clean. So it's just things that, again, we've been talking about now. The strategic plan will definitely go through um, and provide direction um, and help and again, may change some of the strategic priorities that we go through and, and look at. The other thing that I, I mentioned when it comes down to the, the budget as well is we're six months into this year's budget. Um, Russ, I, I, I like the fact you brought up it's still uncertainty because you know, of what's going to happen in the next six months. You know, do we return to normal or do we stay hyper speed like we are? Does that go through and affect uh, certain things? And we'll certainly see more in the, in the next couple of months. When it comes down to some budget assumption, some things I, I did want to point out. One is return to normalcy uh, with travel, including international as well as meetings and business travel. And I think you'll see that a little bit from staff when they present a little bit later on today. But even what we're starting to see, um, you know, with, with, the, with the interest in the airlines, I can tell you, you know, we, there's an interest from an additional Canadian airline um, in, the, in the area and other international um, plus, we, you know, we've got now advertising running internationally where, you know, we had not been going through and doing that. So look for a re return to that. Uh, interesting, Mr. Chair, when you brought up the cruise passengers, was talking to some friends of our daughter that are going on a cruise, and the two of them are going on a five-day cruise and for $500. You know, um, so the cruise lines have priced things very inexpensively to get people out traveling to fill the ships up. Will that come back? And, you know, now we return back to normalcy in terms of traveler and or seasonality and um, and or markets. Um, I also, Mayor Hibbert, I liked your question regarding um, uh, our pricing. And so one of the things we'd have down as a performance measure to watch is that percent change in ADR. Um, and, and again, this is at when the forecast that we got from STR, um, which really looks at the hotel side of things, for our area going through for the, uh, up until, uh, well, for the rest of 22 and then through six months of 23, on ADR for uh, 22 being up 11.7%, but being down 4% in, in, in 2023. Again, that's their forecast given everything that, that there is today. And again, I, you know, is that a return to, you know what, you know, we have a different traveler, we're turning back to that, some of that normalcy. Um, when you look at occupancy, um, on, on that number, those, those margins grow less and less. In fact, when we look at this past March, so we're looking at a, uh, a year ago, last year, and then this year in terms of occupancy, um, our growth was relatively small, about 2 or 3%, but our rate was up about 30%. So again, when you look at some of the numbers that Jim presented related to TDT revenue, it's really being driven by rate. And, I, and I'm gonna suggest it's the same for vacation rentals as well as on the hotel side. But also look at it, you know, we were at mid 80s in occupancy, which uh, Mr. Kimball, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, technically that's pretty close to being sold out if you've got, you know, mid 80s as your occupancy. So we're solid during the month of March, even, even into April. So again, looking at a budget assumption of norm, returning to normalcy, um, again, on the, the budget is, as we look forward, there are three areas within the strategic plan that we talk about that, um, again, come down to our involvement. One of those being what is owned by Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And what I mean by that is what are we going to be taking on? So if we're hearing from stakeholders, we've heard from a variety of different people that says we need to be doing X, um, that's something we need to get done, which means we need to go through to under, undertake that. We're also seeing where do we need to partner and collaborate. And, I, and there was a lot of those suggestions. Um, and again, that'll be reflective um, in the budget. And then where do we advocate? 
um, again, for things that impact the industry in a variety of different ways. Um, in going through for fiscal year 22, the current budget that we are in, um, projected right now that we would uh, expend 97% of our budget based on programs we've committed to, uh, you know, staff traveling, doing all the things that we said we were going to do at this point in time, we'll have expended 97% of our, our budget. Uh, for FY23, our FTEs will be staying uh, flat, the same as this year, which is at 48. And then uh, one item I did want to mention on there was that we did move the amount for elite events up to the maximum that it's allowed under the plan up to $2 million. Again, that is we have it available. It doesn't mean we commit to all of it if programs don't qualify or we don't get the applicants, but we did fund it to that level. Plus we had increases, uh, we added a new category and an increase in the, the, the category one. So that kind of sets the budget assumption of us of us going going forward. The first slide I want to go through, and this is looks at expense recap by area. So looking at operations, promotions, personnel, and then the grand total. The column to the left is our actuals from fiscal year 21. And again, I you know I should you know caution with that. You know the first part of fiscal year 21. We actually um, still had programs that did not happen um, because we really did not see everything start jumping until March of uh, of twenty of uh, twenty one, and then so that left that first quarter where there were still expenses that didn't take place. The center column is our operating budget for fiscal year twenty two, and you can see the grand total there was at thirty six point seven million. And then the column to the right is the request for the current, uh, for fiscal year 23, where that request would be 40.5 40 million, um, with 3.4 going to operations, 31.5 to promotions, 5.5 to uh, personnel. When you look at uh, increases over the FY22 budget, and I just, uh, looked at where some of the major items were. You can see where the increases were. So in digital marketing, we went through and increased our uh, uh, expenses there by a uh, half million. For elite events, as I mentioned, we increased that by 750,000. For advertising and promotions, uh, increased it by 1.4 million. Um, international sales by 35,000. Direct sales, um, almost a million and then research around, around 49,000. Uh, Again, looking at the reasoning behind some of those, um, as an example, with advertising and promotions, uh, we actually have um, the big portion of that is 1.3 million of that, which is for uh, BVK and for our traditional um, um, advertising. When you look at direct sales, uh, the increase is mainly due on this case is to film incentives, and Tony will address what's happening in the, the film commission side, um, but also increase in some of our activations and local uh, uh, sponsorships. And I bring up research, um, and uh, and from there because again, you know, data having the data helps make the decisions. And what we've done is allocate additional dollars. Um, part of it is so that we can do more event surveys. Again, thinking we're going to have more people that apply, so we want to have the data to show what those events bring to our community. Um, and then the, the other aspect is to keep up some of the surveying that we currently do, whether it's ad effectiveness study, the uh, website ROI. Again, all the things that we go through to do to go back and say the dollars that we are expending produces a return for um, uh, the community as well as the um, um, industry. When you get to expense recap by department, and again, all of this is in the budget book, but I just try to consolidate everything down to a few slides before we get into the department presentations. But again, from different departments, uh, this is the amount that's been requested by each, de each department. Uh, Topping that is advertising promotions at almost 16 million, digital and communications at 7.2 million, 
Film Commission at two, MNC at 1.7 million, sports and events at 939,000, then community and brand engagement at 423,000, leisure travel at 290, Latin America sales 273,000, executive sales 68,000. So that's that kind of recaps the kind of sets the stage for the presentations from the different different departments. The information that I covered is basically pages six, seven, and eight within your budget uh, budget book. Yes, yeah, six, seven, and eight of your uh, budget book. So before I have departments make their presentation. Any questions on really focus and or budget assumptions? Ms. Moore. Thank you. I stepped out of the room and maybe you did touch on it, but I, I wanted to ask a few questions about the implementation of the strategic plan. I see it focused on all of the various departments and they were talking about, so the departments have already seen that strategic plan? No. So, it, it seems awkward to me that we're talking about a strategic plan that we've had, but we haven't seen it. We're making budget projections based on information that we don't know. And, and I'm concerned about actual implementation. I mean, we've got positions that have been open for a long time, per the chart, but also from past history, knowing that, that we have and, and I think that, um, you know, so the question is, when is that all going to take effect? How, how is that going to be implemented? So the next, the next phase, and a great question. So the next phase with uh, strategic plan is, we, um, is again in May to have them have a presentation to this board, but also to our staff to go through. Here's the findings that we got out of this. For us from that point is, um, you know, you know, at, you know, as an example, when it comes down to our message and content, uh, to have a you know more varied message other than what we have for the beach. Okay, what are we doing within the different departments um, around that? Some of it we're already doing. We just need to make sure that it's it's brought forward. Um, the other aspect to that is it you know again like to say under collaboration. Um, and working with local entities to carry out uh, certain messaging or certain types of programs. It may be a refocus of some of the programs we have. I don't see us going through to increase the budget itself to make it happen um, and really use that over the, the next six months. From a timing perspective, we've moved through the, the process on the strategic plan as quickly as possible. But again, it wasn't designed to be matched up with the budget process. And again, we're so so early in, in this um, and being able to, to carry that out. You know, we get the information in, make the presentations, and then, and then go, go from there. And again, there will be things in the plan that we won't be able to do next year. It'll be in the year following. Um, but again, it's laying, it's laying everything out. Um, just a, you know, quick question. What which particular budget is the um, chamber support in? I mean, I see it. I see it on the line item. I don't know what department. I'm sorry. What department does it belong to? So I know. Uh, Terry, does that come out of um, operations? Yes. So uh, Chambers, as well as Creative Pinellas, come out of, so on page, on page. I'm looking at, I'm looking at page eight, which lists all your department budget overview, and none of that's there. Yeah. Then, right? Yeah, if you go to page six. Yeah, I, at the I look very at that. I look top, at that. At the very top, where it says other contractual services. And it says 1.176 million was our approved budget. The re proposed budget is 1.141. That in there we have not only Creative Pinellas, but we have the Chambers of Commerce. Yeah, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think that's where it belongs in operations. I mean, because we're going to be having these conversations on how we can possibly 
put more support out there for certain things. You know what I mean? It just that, like for instance, um, you've got department budget overview on page eight, community and brand engagement. Compute community engagement to me is where you would put visitor centers and all that stuff, but I'm just trying to figure out when I can talk about it because it doesn't feel like I can talk about it if you're going over the departments and you know what I'm saying? Yes, and let me make a correction. Um, it is actually under uh, promotional expenses under direct programming and it says chambers, visitor service support and it's, it has the half million there. My, my apologies. Yeah, so where would I talk about that? What department would I talk about? Because it doesn't feel like you're gonna talk about promotional expenses. Um, let's talk about under community and brand engagement. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, two questions. Uh, personnel, um, I saw the budget for personnel. Does that include filling the vacant positions, the yeah. budgeted amount? Okay. Yes, it does. Great. And this is, don't mean to add, ask a loaded question to go back to renourishment, but the study that people feel need, need to be, well, needs to be done, uh, where is that paid for? Who, who pays for that study? Would that come out of the 26 million already in the renourishment fund? Because that's my one concern. It's why I voted yes to move the, to I, 1%. I don't think we're asking for a study. We're asking, I guess it would be Kelly, right? Just opinion? Kelly Levy. I mean, it's our personnel that would look at it and t advise us, right? That's kind of what I thought. I'd heard using well, it outside. Well, we have, we have funds in our general fund, uh, but I don't know if we allocate from that department to under here. Uh, that uh, Jim, do you know that off the top of your head? Everything sand, does it come out of this, or is it we also have under our natural resources? comes out of the TDT fund and transferred into the capital fund. Um, how they operate, I don't know if it comes out of public works as part of, you know, part of their, or their overall budget. Um, I would say that they have a plan. It's not a, you know, figure out as it goes along. Um, but that's why we know we have $26 million because they've, it's been allocated and then some years they spend more, some years they spend less and that's how it's accumulated. But as far as where the study would come from, I don't, know that offhand. Yeah, it's, I mean, this, if this didn't exist, if this fund didn't exist, we would still be doing the studies and the, the planning. This is not something that we're, you know, we're looking at for this month. We have a year plan that we have out for um, sand key, long key, the whole process. I just couldn't, I didn't know if we had, for any of the capital part, if we'd allocated it out of this, but we have all, we have staffing time that's dedicated to that. And we've done studies um, we've paid for studies out of other funds in previous years when we did the study down in, in uh, Tier Verde for the, um, with USF and Dr. Ping. Um, but I don't think there's any money allocated out of this fund for those operational expenses. But I, I wouldn't be 100% on that. Uh, Mayor Welch, who's next? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, can you send us this PowerPoint? I've got everything else, but not that summary. It's a little bit different. Where's the, the uh, film commission in this printed? Is it on page? As in the seven? as in the budget book. I'm on, on page six or seven. Does it break out the film commission? Page eight. Page eight. Page eight. Yes. It shouldn't be included on six or seven anywhere. Because I was able to follow, you know, advertising promotions and some of the others, but I don't see film commission. Terry, related to the film commission, the um, is this on? The majority of their expenses you'll find within the direct sales line under promotional expenses. They also have uh, training and um, travel expenses, which will show up in those lines on page six. It's in the $5.6 million number? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. So yeah, obviously you're going to have cross-reference. You're going to have direct sales in each one of our departments. You're going to have travel in each one of our departments. You're going to have new HP equipment, not Apple, in each one of our departments. So <laughs> you have to just kind of you know look across those budget items. Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got two questions, Steve. Um, in the private sector, um, we struggle right now with um, labor from an increased standpoint. Um, we've gone up, I'm going to guess, 25 percent in the last 12 months in our labor budget. It's, it's catastrophic, really. Um, but I see in your budget from this year going into 2023 only a 3 percent increase. Do you have any struggles um, with, with um, hiring and, and what you're budgeting to pay people? In the, the couple positions that we filled currently, we had a number of people that applied, applied for the position um, so that we were able to make a, a good choice on who we wanted to bring on board. The, 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 bigger, the bigger opportunity going forward is, um, are we at what I'm gonna call market competition so that we don't lose staff to you as, as a hotelier or a tech company or, or, or. So that really gets down in more into the classification of the positions um, as well as the pay. So that, that we have to look at in the coming year. So 3%. Um, and then the follow-up question on it, just the overall budget, you went from um, 24 million, 24.6 million essentially, and this year the 2023 budget is 28 point we'll call it $29 million, does that correlate to the increase from a percentage standpoint of revenues collected in the tourist development taxes for Pinellas County if they're going up, I'll make it up 10%, is your budget going up 10% um, from an operating standpoint? No, it does not go, it's not correlated to the increase that you see in, in TDT collections. And, and why I ask that question is, as we grow the, the surplus fund on the capital side, we've had the discussion all morning long about what we, what we can do with those funds going forward, but those are spent on capital projects. When it comes to the operating side, um, we're under the obligation to spend that on marketing our destination. So as that portion of the fund increases, and we're not spending it, I don't see in the future how we're going to spend it if it keeps growing up, if it's not in the budget. What, what would you say you would use those surplus dollars meant for marketing and advertising in the future if it keeps growing? What, what do you foresee spending those dollars on? You know, I think going, you know, for us to go in and, and say, you know, we wanted to do something specific at, you know, say there was a specific type of campaign, specific type of messaging, whatever that might be. If it's not built into the current budget, how do we go through and work with OMB to say, we're expending all the dollars here. Yeah. So, you know, the request that we have, is, you know, we're going to spend our full 40 and yet we could do this program here, go in and, and make the ask of whatever that dollar amount is and that program and then what the the ROI would be back on that. Thank you very much. And, I, and I'm all about keeping a surplus fund in, in, in my world and private business. That's what we do. We have to be prepared for downturns in the economy. So it's smart. I just am nervous that that fund gets bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, how, you know, where do those dollars go? Thank you very much. Mayor Hibbert. Well, I appreciate the last comment because my only concern is not building a reserve. Because right now when we've got high occupancy, great ADR, and you know, we're gonna have another recession eventually. And you know, then we'll need dry powder to really put ourselves at the forefront and maybe more events or other things that drive, you know, heads and beds. I just wanna make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves when we've got enough business right now that we're in really good shape. And I do hope we're just making certain that we're paying everybody enough for retention and recruitment. So. Mr. Yeah. Kimball. Um, 
I agree with what's been said, uh, the last two comments, but part of this meeting, I believe, is, Steve, that if you see in the presentations, or if we see in the presentations today, any one of them that we should suggest to adjust or do something more to, we can, this is the time to do it. And for example, we have markets that aren't here and we're not sure what's going to happen or what the timing is, international, whether it's Canada or Europe or South America or some of those other things. This is the time that we need to be looking at this. And it's hard for us to know where it is in the budget necessarily, but we need to be able to talk about and say, let's adjust this by so much. We also, I think we fund reserve back to uh, beaches out of this also. So we are minusing some numbers already. But I think that that's what we got to look at is to say, is there something we ought to increase? And this is not using the big amount of funds, but to increase or decrease whatever it is that go along today. Anyone else? All right. If there are no other questions on this, then we'll move to the different departments. And uh, first up will be Katie with advertising and promotions. And Liz is coming to get the magic clicker. Hello, uh, good to see everyone this morning. Um, this morning I'm gonna share some recaps, updates, and highlights of some initiatives moving forward. So uh, we are well on our way with our 2022 media plans. Uh, we presented the plans to you all uh, for October to March last fall, and the plans for April through September at last month's TDC meeting. As you'll recall, we have extensive broadcast, television, radio, digital billboards, and print media buys spanning our target markets. Uh, our developmental markets we've identified as Chicago, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Nashville, Atlanta, and our maintenance markets, Orlando, Jacksonville, Fort Myers, Naples. In our FY22 media plan, we increased the focus on highlighting St. Pete Clearwater as a premier arts destination, targeting arts enthusiasts and some of their favorite arts-focused magazines, such as Art in America, Art News, and Afar. And although we have identified these highly targeted tactics to promote the arts, we will also run focus, arts-focused ads nationally in the New York Times, T Magazine, Arts and Design Issue, as well as in several city lifestyle publications. A follow-up post-campaign advertising effectiveness study with destination analysts will be deployed next month, and we will look forward to sharing those results with you uh, later this summer. If you recall, back in September, we shared with you the results from the previous year's advertising effectiveness study, and so we hope to see uh, continued results, uh, continued great results. We plan to release the Gulf to Bay issue number 10 destination magazine next month, the 116-page glossy magazine. Um, will offer potential visitors a resource for dreaming about and planning their next getaway to St. Pete Clearwater. Using feedback from our Gulf to Bay issue number nine reader survey, uh, we had a card inserted in the magazines and asked people to provide their feedback for the chance to win a trip. Got great feedback, um, and with that, um, those findings, we expanded coverage of our Best of St. Pete Clearwater section and prioritized our dining information. Um, those were both highly, uh, most highly sought out sections in the magazine according to the survey. So we look forward to releasing the magazine next month. A robust print distribution of 500,000 magazines is currently planned uh, with newspaper inserts uh, this summer in the New York Times, Atlantic Journal-Constitution, Indianapolis Star, Tennessean, Cincinnati Inquirer, uh, Orlando Sentinel, Jacksonville Times Union, and Tampa Bay Times as well as brochure distribution at the Visit Florida Welcome Centers and both of our local airports. Um, also direct mail to people that request the magazine from our website and at our dom international and domestic trade shows. Katie, is your microphone on? Um, I think so. There you go. Yeah, just lean forward. Okay. In a late summer 2021, destination analysts visit St. Pete Clearwater and agency BBK worked closely together to develop research objectives and, quest and questionnaire for a comprehensive brand perception study. 
The primary objectives of this research were to explore the St. Pete Clearwater destination brand, how leisure travelers perceive St. Pete Clearwater and the destination's competitive situation from the perspective of key geographic markets. And Dave Bratton with Destination Analyst presented those findings from that initial research at the February TDC meeting. Um, and I'm going to call it a couple um, highlights um, but I want to bring attention to. So St. Pete Clearwater received high ratings um, for opportunities to relax, beaches that suit my taste, outdoor activities, natural beauty, restaurant, local food scene, appealing hotels, resorts, and overall ambience atmosphere. Those were also some of the most important destination attributes travelers consider when choosing an overnight leisure destination and should be prioritized in messaging to attract new visitors from our top feeder markets. The statement 35 miles of pristine coastline with warm, gentle Gulf water and gorgeous sunsets is the highest performing attribute for appealing statement and believability, suggesting that our beaches are our biggest pull and motivator for leisure travelers. So the brand perception study will be conducted annually to continually understand how travelers see us and to measure if we're making an impact on our key feeder markets. So uh, coming up, our marketing agency summit is on the books, it's scheduled for May 10th and 11th. And that's where we invite um, all our agency partners, including BVK, Miles Partnership, uh, NJFPR, Destination Analysts, other research partners and our international agencies to get together here in the destination and, um, and, and have a robust conversation. It's critical in developing our FY23 planning framework, including the target demographics, psychographics, uh, traveler visitor market of origins. It will align our team on our brand and creative strategy, outline media recommendations for the coming fiscal year. Um, a few of the topics that we plan to discuss include um, the, strate the findings from the strate strategic plan. Uh, Robert Allen from HCP will present the strategic plan for uh, facilitated conversation. Uh, we will uh, meet, uh, have all the VSPC department directors together to understand how the marketing team and our agency partners can best support them and their goals in 2023. We will perform a deep dive into our research looking at our website, key site performance metrics, um, our 2021 visitor profile, the advertising effectiveness studies, our brand perception study, um, and look at competitive destination analysis, among many other studies and research that we're gathering right now. We will build an advertising and marketing strategy that will increase brand awareness and intent to stay in pay overnight paid accommodations and for the St. Pete Clearwater area. And as we've been doing, we'll measure those campaigns with destination analysts. Really excited. This past year, we have executed a variety of research, including the brand advertising effectiveness, and also creative testing research to help improve our marketing and advertising performance. A new brand campaign will be built around those findings and unveiled later this summer, early fall. The campaign will continue to dial up the St. Pete Clearwater experiences that can only be found here to help travelers detect a stronger sense of place. Continue to highlight the breadth of the destination and what it is, what is new and exciting. The campaign will align with travelers' definition of vibrancy, that it is colorful, exciting, live, and energized, showing a variety of things to see and do with a more upbeat and exciting vibe. Communicate relaxation and rejuvenation in an upbeat way. And op and uh, we will optimize the campaign to portray a wider range of traveler ages, particularly families. We have a, a photography and a commercial video shoot scheduled for next month. And like I said, um, the new brand campaign will be unveiled later this summer, early fall. Look forward to sharing that with you. Another thing um, is, um, you know, we continually, our plans will be built to drive inspiration. We will pick media tactics that break through the clutter and reach consumers through unique and engaging initiatives. Um, look for media extensions, activations, and influencer programs to tell the story of the destination in longer form. Be creative, promote reasons to travel now for our in-state audience. And uh, you may have seen um, uh, this morning's uh, Tampa Bay Times newspaper on the front cover uh, highlighted our partnership with Colin Donaldson, also known as Trash Colin on TikTok, 
Through his voice, um, and he's pictured there in the bottom right, Colin, through his voice, we've been able to reach a wide audience to spread our unwind and be kind message, which asks people to please remember to be kind to our beaches, beautiful beaches, and fellow travelers and locals. On Tuesday, May 3rd, during National Travel and Tourism Week, we will be sharing more about the campaign and engaging in a conversation with our partners at Cape Pinal's beautiful Ocean Allies, Clearwater Marine Aquarium, and Winter the Dolphin Beach Resort. It will be in the afternoon at Bellwether Beach Resort on St. Pete Beach. I hope uh, many of you can make it. So we will continue to partner with diverse influencers to raise awareness that St. Pete Clearwater is a vibrant, well-rounded destination. Um, based on research, 49% of consumers depend on influencer recommendations. And on average, influencer marketing campaigns earn $5.78 for every dollar spent. So we will, um, these influencers are great at showcasing the experiences um, that go beyond the surface of what travelers traditionally take part of in a trip to St. Pete Clearwater, showing them uh, the unknowns about the destination. It um, will be designed to establish St. Pete Clearwater as a well-rounded vacation destination through priority target audiences, LGBTQ, Latino, African-American content creators, um, with an emphasis on encouraging visitors to explore the beach and beyond. It will position St. Pete Clearwater as a year-round destination um, from our key regional flight markets, uh, Chicago, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Nashville, Atlanta. And while each trip will have a different theme and seek to highlight an array of activities, they will all um, provide cultural immersion both on and off the beach. So I shared with you um, some of the things that we're working on right now um, and some of the things that we are um, planning for. And like I said, we're really excited about our marketing agency summit next month with all of the partners to really build out, um, to take a look at the research and what we've done now and to kind of put, put forth um, the plan moving forward. So um, as Steve mentioned, the total budget request is 15974000 with approximately 97% of that directed uh, through BVK um, through our advertising promotional services contract. Um, Steve mentioned the return to normalcy uh, provides more opportunities for international marketing, airline development, department support uh, with meetings and conventions, um, our sports promoters, film promoters, travel agents, and top tour operators. So um, we will be including um, a budget uh, uh, line items in our budget for those initiatives. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mayor Welch has 73 followers on TikTok. What, what level of influencer would he be considered? <laughs> <laughs> those those little mints that you have, those you know. Any questions? Thank you. Very good, Katie. Thank you very much. All right, Mayor Welch. So, what's the emerging social media? Well, TikTok. So we are um, we are partnering with Colin Donaldson. Um, he has 1.4 million followers on TikTok. And his uh, mission is to collect trash on the beaches. So we're partnering with him with our Unwind and Be Kind campaign. And um, it was actually highlighted as on the uh, front of today's Tampa Bay Times newspaper, our partnership with him and his, his I following think I saw and reach. Him on Instagram or Twitter. So where do they rank? Are they old school? <laughs> where he, Feel free to speak freely. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's up and coming. He's... Um, Amazing uh, attraction. He's not just a micro influencer. He's a major influencer. Do you see those channels as equal? Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or is there one that's the go-to? Yeah, Eddie could probably take that. But yeah, there's it's difference between the audience and the age range for sure. So you use all of them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. To reach a different message for on, on each of them. You're being very tactful in your answers. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. <laughs> Check it out. Further questions? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And we are excited again the the with the activities that BVK has been doing. And and more importantly, I'm glad Katie brought this up is our agency summit. This is this will be our third time, uh, third year in a row. 
of bringing everyone together. Um, last year was about 50-50 between virtual and in-person. Uh, the first one we did was all in person, and that was in February before uh, before the pandemic. Uh, this year, uh, we actually will have everybody here in person. The only ones that we won't is we'll have our partners from the UK and Germany joining us virtually. But again, it's really to set the you know the high level stage of of moving forward messaging things that we need to do to better impact uh, visitation. You know things things that we can do to, to work together. And actually all the departments are there so that we can truly utilize the talents around the room to go through and, and put together the, the program. And then last year, as you all remember, in September, we made a presentation that gave a detailed media plan of what we'll be doing for the next six months going forward. We will be doing the same thing this year, uh, this year as, as have, having that. And that'll come from all of our different um, agency partners. The uh, Next presentation is on digital and communications. Um, and as Eddie walks up, um, I, I did want to make comment of the fantastic job that both he and Mackenzie are doing. Um, you know, even with the, the absence of um, the VP position, Leroy in this case, uh, they both have stepped up to the plate and kept initiatives, uh, initiatives going. Um, on the PR side, and again, again, this comp, this budget, majority of it, it's with Miles Partnership, um, and then also research, but we do have dollars built in for NJF, which is our PR agency that we utilize out of New York, and we're excited about what that team has been doing for us um, and really helping pitch a lot of these national stories um, um, that we see. But um, again, I want to thank um, Eddie and Mackenzie for what they do to, to make all, all this happen. And um, Mayor Welch, I know that Eddie will answer your question. Um, he did, I heard him. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> and what's interesting is uh, Jimmy, our staff that handles a lot of our social media, is now getting into TikTok. Um, I, I'm like you, or, or the chair, I thought it was a tic tac. Um, so, uh, but you know, I think it comes down to age and comfortability of using your device. Um, and the one thing I did wanna mention in this budget is research. And again, there's a lot of research that we do and, and I think it's very important that we document all the things that we're involved in for the ROI perspective. The other part beyond the ROI is to understand our visitors so that in this case, targeting from a digital standpoint um, and regular media uh, makes, up, makes a lot of sense. So Eddie, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the question about social media. Um, to be honest, we have to be on all of them for different reasons. And this actually plays into, I think, a really interesting story about how fragmented the media landscape is right now, which for people like myself and uh, Katie, it, it creates several challenges, but at the same time, there's several opportunities and there's uh, many, many reasons for us to be very excited as marketers right now. Um, so I'm sure that there is someone out there, by the way, making uh, Tic Tac videos on TikTok. But uh, that aside, you know, there's there's uh, Facebook, which allows us to generate um, some of our best social advertising uh, opportunities. There's uh, Twitter, which is a resource, and LinkedIn, which is a resource to share some of the best uh, news um, from a visual perspective. Uh, platforms like Instagram and TikTok are really great at showcasing the destination and the beautiful assets that we have. And interesting, uh, YouTube is also sort of shifting into more of a social media platform where you can post um, stories and posts, not just you know video clips and, and uh, TDC meeting videos and things like that. So um, that's becoming a, more of a socially engaging platform as well. Um, and again, it, it, it's kind of the story of how things are starting to blend together. Um, from an advertising and promotions you know, standpoint, we're talking about Influencers, that could also fall into the range of, of digital and communications, but it's all kind of blending together and it's kind of points, makes more of an emphasis on why uh, these agency meetings that we have each year are, are very important uh, to all kind of come together and talk about that. Um, so a couple of things, uh, this past year, we, we launched our new uh, leisure website uh, for Visit St. Pete Clearwater. We're very excited about that. Uh, we're also in the process of uh, relaunching our sales, our film, 
our sports websites uh, to make those a lot more uh, engaging and interactive. And I know that uh, the team over here is asking me uh, when, that, when, when those are coming out um, very soon. Um, but with digital and communications, a couple of things that we're very excited about for this next year are really based on uh, some of the excellent uh, areas of opportunity that we saw for growth uh, in this fiscal year. <clears throat> so, um, and I'll just be touching on a couple of those. This past year, we saw some great uh, success with connected TV platforms like Hulu, where we ran a 30 second ad spot that uh, actually had further engagement where a viewer could uh, click on the ad spot to view more content about the destination. Uh, we know that during the pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, on average, uh, the uh, connected TV media consumption grew uh, by an hour per household per day. So it's an area that really continues to grow in viewership. <laughs> and it's uh, something for us for, from the brand awareness perspective and from a trip consideration, it's, it's a great channel for us to be on and to put more resources on. Uh, there's, there's a huge opportunity for growth uh, on that channel. Another one is uh, search engine marketing, which is a term that you guys are probably fairly familiar with. Uh, something that kind of came out in the last year and a half or so are dynamic search ads, which basically take a website page or an entire site and they scan that content and create ads uh, that are optimized to an audience looking for that type of content. Um, these ads have really increased our performance from search engine marketing. Um, they've lowered our cost per click uh, by sometimes 35 to 40% uh, lower cost per click per month this year. And we know that the return on ad spend for uh, SEM channels like this is about 36 to one. And it's a low funnel opportunity for us. So uh, people are ready to really start you know, planning their vacation at, at this moment in time. So it's, it's a great place for us to be. And again, it's another opportunity with a lot of room for growth. Um, we are actually cutting down on, on some things um, with the new website, with our niche sites. We will uh, be spending less hours on development and uh, the operating costs involved in that. And we'll be putting more of that budget towards uh, media spend. Um, we will also be reinvesting in content, which is something that we continue to do. We're constantly auditing our site, um, improving the content on our site, um, also looking at uh, SEO terms to figure out where we need to uh, continue to build new uh, pages of content. Um, and this is a really effective tool for us to drive uh, SEO web traffic to our site, which is organic site traffic as well as um, help us build out campaigns for native advertising platforms like uh, Nativo, which uh, we saw a huge success um, this, this past year on and, and we'll continue to do that. And it helps us uh, with the collaboration from content publishers like Afar or TripAdvisor or Expedia or Condé Nast. So that's just kind of a, a sampling of a couple of places where we're uh, making a greater investment. Um, Included uh, some other additions will also include uh, rich media, which is like um, banner ads, but more interactive, like uh, the example I showed with, with Hulu, um, native advertising, uh, programmatic display, and uh, digital audio. So there's quite a few, as I said, quite a few different places where we need to be to really showcase the destination and um, very exciting. So any questions? Questions? At what point do you see our digital budget overtaking our traditional budget? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, taking one from the other. So I, it's difficult for me to answer that. But, you know, I think that there is room for growth in our, in our digital um, marketing opportunities. Like I said, you know, the landscape is such that it's, 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 it's pretty different than it was five or six years ago. Um, people aren't watching cable television necessarily. They're, they're watching streaming television. So we have to make sure that we're there as well as there in broadcast TV. And we have to be um, in spots in ways that aren't disruptive to the user experience of, of whatever they're trying to do. It's actually you know, helping the person you know, make a, make, make 
uh, a decision to travel or to start thinking about traveling when, when they're ready to do that. So we have to really think about effectively, you know, where we place our ads that, that isn't just, you know, thro throwing it away, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, we see that, and I'm sure the mayor saw that uh, last year, you know, just a few years ago in a political campaign, uh, your digital budget was a very small, you know, you throw up a few Facebook ads, and now the digital portion of the budget is, and granted, it's a different animal, but it's it's equal to or sometimes surpasses the traditional. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly, the print has gone the wayside in the cam political campaigns, and there's still broadcasts, obviously, because you need to hit uh, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy hour. But um, but again, targeting different audiences. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's interesting. I uh, before this position was the director of marketing for Visit Big Bear, um, and. At, in that uh, facility, we basically had it a 50-50 split, but uh, you know it, it takes a lot to invest in traditional uh, avenues, um, and so for a smaller DMO, it's a, it's a different question than for an organization like ours. So it, it, it's still kind of hard to answer that. Uh, Mayor Welch, you said you were with Visit. Uh, Visit Big Bear in, in, in California, but Big Bear, uh, California. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, you mentioned web services. Do we farm that out? Yes. Yeah, we uh, have a contract with Miles Partnership that includes uh, both the uh, digital media um, and website services. So this might be outside of your area, but how are we handling cybersecurity? Is that under BTS, or how, what's our approach on cybersecurity? So anything related to the organization, email, um, all of those things, it's all done through BTS. Okay. And then uh, we work then with Miles that's related to our website um, and anything that they have to protect that. And then our CRM, which is where we put all of our customer information, that's through a, a third vendor and they have cyber security for that. Okay, thank you. And again, um, you know, the, the one element, you know, when Mayor and you, or Mr. Chair, and you brought up, you know, the ratio of digital to traditional, I think it's how you marry the two uh, to get across to the audiences that you need to get across. And sometimes you may have a combination of things in a market. Um, other times you may just go in with digital. And because the fact, um, in fact, one of the research partners that we have with, with Buxton, we can look at a profile of a visitor and you know and and let's say they're looking at me as that that profile well they'll know that i'm more typically going to read magazine versus look at email versus watch tv and so if you want this person then you need to come up with this strategy on someone else it may be no you need to reach them in a digital format so well it was interesting in the, the slide that katie had up there about 86 percent of women uh consult or or use social media when uh, making purchase decisions uh, in this arena um, that, you know, certainly tells you way, the way things are going. And um, in our household, the women make the decisions on pretty much everything we do. So um, that 86% number was pretty important. That never changed. <laughs> that never, that's right. <laughs> that never changed. That was always 100%. Yes, they should. Yes, they should. <laughs> All right. Um, Can next? I just ask one other follow-up question just to make sure it's clear in my head? So. When you look at denial of service or ransomware or all those threats that are out there, we're depending on the folks we're contracting to with to have all those safeguards in place. So as an example, with, with my non-technical knowledge, you know, like for ransomware, typically it's going off of an email. I'm going to click, and then you open up something you shouldn't. Next thing you know, your computer's right. affected. That would all come under BTS because we're through that email, the county email system. Um, on the website, they're doing anything that they need to do to ensure the the security and the privacy on on that. So Miles Partnership does does that. But anything related to whether it be a desktop, laptop, email, Word, Power, whatever. That's all done through BTS. And you do the training and the testing through BTS. Well, there's, they'll send out a phishing email, for example, to our CVB employees. Yeah. You're, you're under that umbrella. So once a year, we get the, uh, the, the quiz 
that or the, the the security test that we have to take that okay. you know takes you an hour to go through and do everything okay. and yes great thank you all right next up i've got um sue's um hackman to talk about meetings and conventions Morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we, we were a little confused because it said yeah, Tony. I, yeah, um, the film will be right after this one. <laughs> we were confused too over there. <laughs> we were like, wait a minute, the agenda is a yeah, little. Is yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, So I am here to talk about meetings and conventions, and I'm so happy that I have a brighter outlook <laughs> than what has been in the past two years when I have been up here. Um, so um, in the recap, you'll see that um, I think when I typed that in March that our room nights were around 65,000 definite room nights for the year thus far, but I'm happy to report that as of April 19th, we are at 87,000 room nights, so indeed surging back. Um, the uh, talk out on the street is that there are more leads coming in than there is space for the meetings, and hotel room rates are sky high, so that is preventing a lot of meetings and conventions from being able to find homes, um, and everything is short term in the month for the month where our term used to be in the year for the year. Everybody needs space now and they need an answer to their RFP yesterday. So these are good problems to have. Um, I think um, taking a look at how we can approach that is going to be key to our success. 66% um, of meeting planners are sourcing now and most report that their next event is gonna be in the next six months. Um, finally, cancellations and reschedulings are at an all-time low, <laughs> which for a while we saw that number hovering around 80%, so we're back down to 10%. And um, they expect a full recovery on the meetings and conventions market by the end of 2023, which still seems a little, little looming, but everything um, appears to be going in the correct direction. One of the things I wanted to talk about is incentive business. So our destination over the last few years, we've been working hard at um, you know, putting our destination on the forefront of this type of business. And um, it's higher rated business. The lead times are short um, right now, which is great for us because the um, ADR is so high. These are the types of groups that can afford to come to the destination. They tend to be a little smaller also. So with uh, hotels being at an all-time high for leisure travel, and they don't have the room space. They don't typically need a lot of meeting space, but they do need a fair amount of rooms. Um, so in 2020, our incentive leads were, um, we had about 37 of them for 12,000 room nights. And in 2021, that jumped to 135 for 38,000 room nights. And since January of this year, we've already as of March, we already had 31 leads come in for 9,000 room nights. So we're seeing this and everything that we're hearing out in the marketplace is that incentive travel is going to stay domestic through 2023. So it's a, which is great for us because it, they can pay the rates that some of our beach resorts are demanding. Some of the other markets that are, are surging forward would be the Florida market. Um, to date, we've booked 53 groups for 21,000 room nights, as well as the Northeast market, which uh, some of this incentive business does come out of that Northeast market, but the Northeast market also is um, home to a lot of financial insurance, pharmaceutical business, which also, also tends to be higher rated. And we have received 108 leads, and 23 groups, groups have gone definite for over 10,000 room nights. So... Um, and most of this has happened within the last three months. Uh, so the pace is, is um, very fast, and we don't expect any change uh, going forward. Um, of the 160,000 room nights that I forecasted, I, in March I was like, mm, I don't know, you know, maybe we'll come in around 100,000, but we're at 87,000 now. I think we're going to be, you know, much closer to that number by the end um, of September. Um, 
one of the things that you'll see in my sales plan is the five most valuable CVB resources. It kind of ties into exactly how the market is going today. Um, and the whole sales plan addresses this in that face-to-face uh, -face is so important right now in the meetings and conventions world. Um, for two, after two years of being at home, planners are eager to get out. Um, so our focus for sales going forward in, for this year and future years is that face-to-face -face contact, is um, bringing people here on fam trips, us focusing on going back to hitting the pavement, going into offices, meeting with clients face-to-face, -face, doing presentations, hosting client events. Um, we, we do have a smattering of, trails, of trade shows in there, but a lot the focus is going to be much more drilled down to um, vertical markets and the face-to-face -face events. Um, another key selling um, tool will be our incentive package that we offer. Um, so just um, we're seeing the competition is, are all coming out with their new, um, I'll use the term cash for contracts. That used to be the big term out in the marketplace. So um, staying competitive in what we can offer them monetarily as well as on the services side with our airport welcome and our postcards and our transportation offsite. Um, just really focusing on what it is that the, is the hot button for the customer and how we can beat out the competition in that. Um, Dedicated uh, experts, so having our salespeople available. Um, I have a good, great team, so when people are traveling, everybody jumps in and helps because we, we are seeing people come here at a very high rate with short-term uh, plans to sign their contracts. So just being able to get them through the destination and feature the properties and the beaches and exactly what they're looking for for their meeting. Um, the other uh, thing that you'll see in the plan is digital and um, advertising. So this was the first year that we started co-op uh, marketing on the meetings and convention side, and it's um, been very successful. I think the hotels were uh, happy to see these campaigns, and, and we're eager to jump on board. Um, we also are going to be looking at uh, doing a new meeting planner guide this year, as well as our website is being redesigned. So I think that all of those things um, in that that is what planners are looking for. I think that that will also be keys to our success. Questions? Thank you, Suzanne. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you too, Mayor. And, and I'm dating myself, but whenever I see you, I think of Scully from the X Files. <laughs> I know. I still I still use that name. <laughs> there you go. It's not gone away. So, um, as y'all know, we've got a um, RFP process for. Tropicana Field uh, underway, and in, in that are is meeting space and convention centers. And over the years, we talked about the need for a right-sized convention center on this side of the bay. And I'm Don't just, let Steve answer this question. Okay. So I'm wondering, <laughs> you know, have you looked at that? Are we still of the mind that the, a right-sized convention center works in this market? What, what's been the latest discussion on that in my time away? <laughs> she said Steve, so. No, I said I don't want him to. Steve likes to joke. Oh, oh okay. Steve likes to joke about a million square foot convention center. Wow, that's big. Um, so actually, one of the comments that we heard out of strategic plan was meeting facility. Um, now, the, the other part of it was then you have to feed the beast. Um, but again, what, what will fit we, given our market and then A, and then B, is there, the, is there the appropriate keys, hotel rooms, that go with it? It's great to have, and I think that one of the proposals was like 50,000 square feet of space. I was um, making 100 for sure. Was it a, yeah, 100. Yeah. So based on that 100, if it's going to be a 100-room hotel next to it, that maybe doesn't make sense compared to something else. So it got to look at all of those, those elements to it. But I know in, in Suze's team, you know, when they're out talking to folks, how hard it is to find space um, and then throw on top of that anything local. You know, so I, I think it would be utilized. I would have to see for whatever that developer is, what mechanism they use to make that determination based on number of groups, usage, et cetera, et cetera. And it's great to see the connection to the beaches with the BRT that can connect to that new convention center. Thank you. What, what is our largest space 
we have currently at, at our hotel facilities for meeting space uh -huh. that would be Innisbrook. and what's what is that i know we talk about i don't know what 50 what i don't know what 50,000 square foot means as far as how many people how many people that can actually accommodate so our our uh, inverness hall <clears throat> excuse me is 14,500 square feet uh, it has an 8,300 square foot pre-function area um, accommodating uh, 1,200 people for a banquet, 1,500 people for theater style setup. 1,200 for a banquet in there? Yeah. Wow. And what, what would you say is that, so that's 1,200 folks that could could be in there for a, a, a grand meeting or a, you know, a, a all hands meeting type thing or, or 1500 for a theater. If, if I could, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we have, um, in addition to the largest ballroom, what is perhaps more enticing to the meetings industry is two junior ballrooms that we have that are 8,000 square feet each. And they're surrounded by 28 smaller breakout rooms and that's really something that's attractive to meeting planners when they have the flexibility of having a general session and then breaking out into smaller groups. And, the, and what, is, what is what you're hearing that of uh, the reason folks are not coming here, the space that next level up? It really depends on which part of the destination you're talking about. If we're talking to um, Mayor Welch's point about St. Pete, the problem is that there's really only two late major properties there, the Vinoy and the Hilton, with a, a lot of meeting space where they can host a group of 350 or 400 or 500 people. So the need becomes greater between it and the beaches, that area, to um, for a hotel that can meet and feed the group. Uh, with like the size of that or the size of a trade winds or the size of a Wyndham Grand on Clearwater Beach. So um, I think we are, we're a good market for 350 people or less where they have a lot of choices. But if you become that group of 350 to 750, we don't have enough of the hotel space and meeting space to offer. And one of the things going back to like uh, DT days was, uh, and he railed against ever building a convention center here, um, was the, at least a standalone convention center. If yeah. you have it connected to a hotel or as part of a hotel, that was a whole different animal. Um, and the issues that they've had in Tampa as far as, have, for meeting planners, this is what I want to hear from you as far as like from the meeting planners, they book at the space of the convention center and then they have to book a ho the hotel rooms and then they have to book the shuttles and then, Whereas if it's at a hotel conference center, they call one person and they book everything. Um, so, sort of, yes. Um, I think that with, in Tampa's case, and Steve could speak to this point too, they, they work in tandem with the convention center. They both go in at the same time to bid on the convention with the convention center saying, yes, we'll give you the space and the CVB helping to find the hotel space that goes at the meeting. Uh, for St. Pete um, and you know, the convention center talk has been around, I've been here 17 years and it was before. I think Carol Ketterhagen used to say, no, we don't want a convention center. But um, it, the need becomes so great now, especially in that Grand Central District where Tropicana sits now and um, to, it would need to be 100,000 square feet or more and possibly with two key hotels, actually. One is probably not gonna do it as, as they've seen with Tampa, how they've grown that downtown market to help house the people because the hotels do sell the single meeting piece of businesses as well as our leisure market which right now, which is taking up a lot of our rooms. Okay. Further questions? I saw some hands over here, I thought. Mayor. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I know it was hard on you, especially you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the last couple of years. So I'm it was happy a little to, depressing. <laughs> I'm happy to see your budget back to where it should be. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I, you know, we are continuing, as you all tell us, to hear um, that we don't have enough hotel rooms with, even without a convention center. Um, and pre-COVID, I brought in a developer and met with all of you because he wanted to understand what size meeting space was appropriate in his hotel and how um, Visit St. Pete Clearwater could help 
fill the rooms if he had you know something going on and what that partnership was. I just think you know, and you may be doing this, but I absolutely think that, and I don't know how you make the connection, and maybe it's through the different municipalities. But when there is a hotel being developed, I know they look at the market, but I know that I don't think they look at this piece, and I think we should really connect that because I found the information we learned when we came to you with that developer to be very informative. And what, what she told us, I'll tell you what it was, was that what North County in general is missing is seated space mm -hmm. for 250 people. Mm -hmm. We have Innisbrook, and then we have Clearwater Beach. And that's it, really, for, for above, you know, for that, that number. And so, um, you know, I think getting that information out to municipalities, so when they do have the developer that comes in and floating ideas at that point, that our staff and, you know, I, I think we need to tell them, and if it were that hurt for hotel rooms, then there are probably various cities, it won't be in Dunedin, in case any Dunedin people are watching because they'd have a fit, um, but you know, more density, that kind of thing. I, think um, I just think we need to connect that, is what I'm trying to say. I think with hotel developers too, a lot of times they're they're seeing the market and they're they're thinking, you know, leisure. Yeah. Because that is the bulk of our business. But um, prior to COVID, thirty percent of our business was meetings and conventions because the hotels that do have that space, they have to have the the meetings and conventions at given right. at some point, usually in the summer. So. Um, I think we see hotels coming in, but they're just not anything that can meet and feed group. Well, and I would also also just say there is, you know, there is a connection to, I mean, I think, when I mean, you may do this again, I, I don't know, but I think there's also a connection where there's areas, like for instance, you know, Clearwater Beach or downtown uh, St. Pete, where there are areas where there are multiple sized hotels, but there's one one guy that's got the room to be able to, you know, have that transportation. I know downtown St. Pete's got the looper. So, you know, it's already, it's going, you don't have to hire somebody. Um, downtown, Cl or Clearwater Beach has got the trolley. Um, but there are probably other areas where those things might be important, you know, and how do we get those things just readily available? So I, I just throw it out because there is a connection to all of it. Absolutely. Mr. Henderson. So, Mike, how many square feet do you have in total for meetings? 65,000. That's big. And the Wyndham has? 40-ish. Uh, <laughs> and Trade Winds? Trade Winds has, well, because they count their outdoor space, they have almost 100,000 square feet of meeting space if you count their the tents tent and their ballrooms and their outdoor space because they can host seven weddings at one time in a day. And they still have the tent out in front of the... They do. <laughs> <laughs> the temporary permanent structure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just trying to get some perspective there. So 100,000 is not yet achieved. Russ could almost be 100,000, too, if, his, if he counted his beach space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be interesting to understand how full are they all the time, you know? Their meeting space or their hotel? Well, like you. Mike, I, you fill it up all the time, or is there a certain season? Or No, we're not. 50% um, of our business prior to the pandemic, 50% of our uh, business mix was conference and conventions. Um, it is coming back, but it is far from being where it is pre-pandemic levels. Um, fortunately for us, the golf and the leisure market has taken up some of that slack, um, and it's highly profitable, but it doesn't replace you know, the convention business that we desperately need. There was a study that came out yesterday by the American Hotel and Lodging Association that they were looking specifically at business travel, that it's down $20 million in 2022 over 2019. Um, Florida is, is down uh, about $1.7 billion and only down 11% over 2019. So as a state, we're doing, we're still doing uh, poorly, but not as poorly as some areas. Um, 
you know, the, the industry heads uh, are talking about the conference business not returning to pre-pandemic levels until sometime well into 2024. So we've got a long way to go before we see that come back. Granted, everything that you say we echo and, and I think you're spot on. The inquiries are up. Um, it's all short term, but the conference and convention business is far from healthy. Like given your size and you're very prominent in this area, right? Do you see, do you feel like, pretend you were back in 2000, 20, 2019. Do you feel that that's the same? Do you feel like we need more space? We don't have the, I say we, Pinellas County does not have that, um, that destination uh, conference location. Um, if you were to build 100,000 square feet of space and a 500 room hotel, yeah, that would, that would solve a big part of the need that Pinellas County has. But it still would not get us into the category of, of, of uh, citywide conventions or large exhibit conventions that Tampa can host. We're far from there. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to comment on a question, um, Friday there is a webinar, uh, a Zoom meeting for Conference Center. Are you involved with that? No. So that's through FRLA is where I have the link from it, um, but it's a group that's looking to do is a Dan Conference Is Danette putting Center. it on? Hmm? Is Danette putting it on? Um, she in, was invited to invite the board. Okay. Um, so I'll find out and can get you that information. Okay, that's at great. 10 a.m. No, on Friday. Yes. Um, that several of us are involved in. Uh, the other, just a comment, my wife is a meeting planner. She has three citywides in the next six weeks. Um, one in Daytona, so the meet, that market is definitely coming back very strong, but she has trouble, most of hers are 700 to 1500 people or more, and has trouble sourcing Pinellas County because of the meeting space. Um, there's only those couple that can do it. She really pushed a November one for you, but couldn't get it. Um, the association market is the last one that's coming back um, because it is membership based and a lot of people, you know, obviously in the pandemic, they. They cut their memberships for, you know, when budgets were cut. So that is the last market that most of the research is saying will come back. And that at, we are seeing that trend as well. Um, we are seeing corporate insurance, pharmaceutical incentive. Those groups are who, you know, fared better than others and smaller that are coming back first, as we were told back in 2020, that was what would happen. But, um, you know, for citywides, we on a convention and visitors bureau level, we try our best. We do offer transportation in our incentive package. So we do, um, if groups are looking um, and, and need to book several hotels and do all the space at one, we do try to help with that uh, transportation portion of it. But the reality is even a citywide is difficult because there's not one hotel that can house the entire meeting. They would have to split the meetings up between hotels. So I think Daytona has a convention center, a smaller one, at, but um, yes. Okay, thank you. Mayor Hibbard. Well, it's not gonna solve the problem, but I would point out Opal Sands is going to be building a second tower with significant convention space. So there'll be up to almost 500 rooms. Yes, they are. Uh, and on the sand, which ultimately is what a lot of the people want once they're done with the meetings, to put a foot in the water. Absolutely. And Russ can always build umpteen <laughs> square footage on his uh, parcel of property. <laughs> if you want to get that approved before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mayor makes a great point. You got to have the attraction in order to do the meeting too. You can't just put it out in the middle and say we're gonna transport people from the beach and the city and put it in the middle and say, okay, we've got a convention center. There's so many of them that it, it's, it's a tough business to put in how much you want to subsidize it each year for each of these cities or counties. Daytona subsidizes theirs quite a bit for many years, they still do. And so you gotta have the attraction. And so that's where the encouragement of building the addition on hotels and so forth like the mayor's talking about is really where it is. And, and for us, fortunately, the groups are, we're doing better than a lot of other destinations. Why? 
because we do outside functions um, that people do around the pool or beach or whatever it is in our area. That's our calling, really. Absolutely. And, and Tampa has their calling with that convention center, thank goodness. And so, you know, our obligation is to get the board meeting or for that one that's going to be in Tampa. And, and if you look at development of hoteliers over the last, uh, I mean, hotels over the last uh, 15 years, 20 years, it's limited service. I mean, you go to Clearwater Beach right now, what opened? AC and, and residents and, and, and those different products. And you got the anchor of the, of the Wyndham and all that uh, has the right positions. But, uh, you know, thank goodness we got Opal coming on with another uh, doubling their size of their meeting space and all, too. They've learned. Uh, but that's part of it. I mean, the developers are developing quasi-limited service hotels where really the money is uh, and all, too. So it's a tough thing for cities to be able to get uh, for that. And I'm not saying you can't, but uh, these smaller ones that are not a million, two million uh, square feet, these cities are paying dearly for year after year on it, too. So, well, and I think that was some of the argument that Steve's predecessors made against, you know, I was there doing a standalone <laughs> type of thing. I yeah. was there. Uh, bringing up, uh, would would uh, Michael uh, the 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 county through the TDT be uh, eligible to partner with a hotel developer to pay for conference space within a hotel? <laughs> I would have to look into the specifics of it. On its face, it doesn't seem like it would be, but convention centers are something that's covered under the statute. So we'd have to look at the project specifics to see if there was some way of accomplishing that. Because I know we had in downtown St. Pete, uh, uh, the university was adding on to their meeting space, and they tried, they floated the idea of the, the CVB, uh, a TDT um, uh, partnering, and it never kind of went to the next stage of development. But um, that is something that, that I always thought we should, because it was, it was part of being a hotel, not just a standalone center. I think so. that's a very, very good idea. Anything further? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, th thank you, Suzanne. And again, you know, um, I, I like how she prefaced not to have Steve answer that question, but, um, but part of it is, you know, from my from my perspective, is meetings is a strong market, and if we were if we were in normal times, a hotel will use meetings and conferences to build a base, and then your leisure comes in and fills in. Um, and and Mayor Julie, um, I've had three phone or two phone calls from potential developers, but both of them leisure. They were building it. What one was wanting to know about the leisure market. The other one, uh, they were building it because it was going to be more long-term stay. Um, and like they a were, condo hotel kind of thing? Uh, no, it was, a, really? it was a hotel brand. Um, huh. But it was long-term, uh, and it involved uh, construction. Um, in, industries were people around for you know two, three, four weeks at a time. And they said they're going gangbusters right now. And so now they're, they're looking at that market. And it was inland. It was not on a beach, and it was not in one metropolitan area. So it, you I know. think finding that connection, though, I mean, we've had a couple of hotels approach us, you know, over the last year during the downtime trying to figure out what they're going to do. And I'm always trying to send them to you. But they're, they don't even make the connection. So that's what I'm trying to say. I think they're, I think we need to get that information to those people yeah. somehow. And however you do that, I don't know if they have their own lobbying organizations or, or whatever. I mean, whatever they use. Uh, what I have found is those that have been around in the consulting business for a while know to go to the local CVB to get certain data. If someone's new in it, they have no idea the world even exists. And yet we're a wealth of information that we can provide overall on the, on the market that, that, that's what's happening. So, all right, well, you asked for it, so we have it. Um, the <laughs> film commissioner himself is here. And are you going to talk about Radar? Radar, the adventures of the bionic dog, yes. Okay, good. Absolutely. Uh, morning, everybody. Good to, uh, good to see all of you. So I know uh, there were some questions right off the bat already about the Film Commission budget at uh, $2 million. 
the Film Commission budget is really $300,000, and $1.7 million of that is the incentives for films in the area. Uh, for this year, it's 800000 but that was actually cut from the original $1.7 million when we had to do our COVID cuts. We had no idea what, what money was coming in last year. So we're really flat from one7 to one7 but we're actually at 800000 this year, which is basically all gone, and then we're already... Um, have so many films coming for next year that we're already getting into that that 1.7 for uh, for next year. Um, the feature films are are booming in the area. Mentioned Radar, The Adventures of the Bionic Dog, which happened to be shooting and still is shooting this week in Dunedin. I have a lovely picture of uh, Superman, Dean Kane, with uh, Mary Brzezowski there as they were shooting at City Hall uh, last week. And so that's been, a, that's been a, a good project, and we've had a lot going on. We have uh, Pet Detectives. It's also shooting right now. It's been shooting Largo Clearwater area and the Plus One, which has been shooting at the Sand Pearl and Clearwater Beach, and that is wrapping up. So three films all shooting simultaneously right now that are all wrapping up this week, basically. Um, and, Tony, uh, there's a big disappointment on Pet Detective because they couldn't get the real mayor of Clearwater uh, to come in. So I played the mayor of Clearwater <laughs> in the movie, so I'm sorry about that, Mayor. Yeah. Well, let me just tell you, in my city, I, they could get the mayor to come in, and then they canceled my, my shot. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Dean Cain is playing the, uh, the mayor of, uh, of Dunedin in the film. And that's uh, one of the great things that, you know, we're doing with these films, and part of the incentive program is that when you're shooting in Dunedin, you're calling it Dunedin in the film. When you're shooting in Clearwater and at the Sand Pearl in Clearwater Beach, you're calling it the Sand Pearl in the film. And all of those are, you know, the marketing and um, promotional things that are being baked into these projects so that when people see them, they're going to know that this is exactly, you know, where those projects are shot. Um, many of you may have seen the TV series Yellowstone that uh, has been a big hit on, uh, on Paramount right now. And the numbers are somewhere like $70 million has brought and been brought into the areas in Montana where that um, show takes place just because people have been, been watching that show. So we don't need to go into all that. We all know that there's a huge impact from people seeing things on, on film and television on, on why they travel. Um, so 16 to 20 films on track for, uh, for fiscal 22 alone, spending close to $12 million. And the, the numbers that we get, you see in the monthly reports, are just the permitted projects. So the permanent projects are actually a small percentage of things that actually shoot within the county because anything that shoots on private property, we do not get any of that data tracked at all. So it's well over $100 million um, in the area in this, uh, in this business segment, basically. So for 2023, we have close to 16 feature films already that are either in some form of development, planning to shoot, talking about shooting. It's just been a, a big boom with all of it. And, you know, I always give a lot of credit to the support of, of, you know, Steve and management and then TDC and the BCC for allowing us to have this incentive program that we've been able to increase over the years. And that's the number one reason that these projects are coming to the area because we're able, really able to get out there and promote and market that we have this program and draw the projects to the area. And we have been spreading the love all over the area and you know, trying to focus on areas like Dunedin and Safety Harbor and, and other areas so that we really do get a, a wide variety of production taking place throughout the, uh, throughout the county. So the commercial business is still strong, as always, you know, by volume. That's the, uh, the largest number of productions that take place in the area. The feature films spend more money per project, so it's always a higher, a higher number there. Like all of the other industries and hospitality and everything, everything else that we're seeing, uh, workforce has become a major issue. There just are not enough crew to work on these projects. And so we do have some workforce development plans in place to help train up some of these crew positions that are needed. Uh, sound, you know, having a sound mixer and a sound person on set, you can't really record any sound if you don't have a sound person to work. And so that, there are, you know, vital positions like that that are needed that we want to work on some things for uh, workforce development. Uh, lack of soundstage space. This is actually a, an international issue with soundstage space. So uh, Georgia and Atlanta are constantly working on building new large soundstage facilities. That kind of goes back to that meetings and convention space that we were talking about. And a lot of facilities around the country are booked out for the next three years. And so projects are literally looking all over just to find that stage space. And I've probably had seven meetings or so with different groups that want to build some sort of sound stage space in the area, ranging from 50,000 to 500,000 square feet, uh, with one group in particular that seems uh, like it has the capital and um, 
you know, the wherewithal to do it more so than some of the others. But there's a lot of, a lot of interest in that. And part of my conversation when I talk to them about this soundstage space is that it be multi-use space. If there's something not being filmed in this space and you've got this enormous space, why couldn't we use it for some sort of meeting convention? Why couldn't it be used for some sort of sporting event, whether it's you know, volleyball tournament or pickleball or whatever, whatever else it might be? Just having some sort of multi-use space um, with this soundstage space. So that's a large part of the conversation when I, uh, when I speak to everybody about this space. So that's just a real quick overview, two slides there, keeping it short for everybody. It's a long day, so questions. Mayor Welch. And uh, I'm just open uh, for casting as well. Just, I just wanted to let you know. Well, you know, now I that we're working, a, working through the, uh, public, the so. public officials, you are next on the list. <laughs> um, great presentation. Um, do we get any uh, support from the state? No. Film that's so that's there? been an ongoing discussion. And we have not had a, a state film incentive since 2016. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the two dolphin tail films that were $20 million plus films that shot in this area were both supported by the state. And we will more than likely not have um, delves into the whole politics, even though it has bipartisan support. The yeah. incoming mm -hmm. Speaker of the House uh, does not support incentives for anything whatsoever. So we're looking at probably the next two years with no state and film incentive as well. This which is, is still like, from the pit bull issue. No, it's really, um, there is an organization called Americans for Prosperity that lobbies against uh, film incentives in the state of Florida, but lobbies for film incentives in the state of Georgia. And that's because they were originally funded by the Koch brothers who have large business interests in the state of Georgia. And they've worked to kill any business that takes away from their business in Georgia. Yeah, there's, a, there's an article that came out a few years ago uh, on Deadline, which is an industry, um, industry website called How the Koch Brothers Killed the Florida Film Incentive. So if anyone's curious and would like to look that up, that really delves in detail and, on why uh, Florida does not have an incentive, even though I get asked on a, on a daily basis by news media and everybody else why we don't have it. Um, mm -hmm. it's one, of, one of those things that we wish we could work around, but it's a reason why our local incentive has been so successful. So without a state incentive, um, you know, Tampa has a local incentive as well. Miami has a, an incentive. But I would have to say that we have been the most aggressive and the most successful with utilizing our incentive to uh, attract projects to the area. When we talk about economic impact, and you're talking about the local spend, uh, how do we track that? So we track that through our film permit software. So anybody that applies for a film permit within the county, we require that they give us the economic data on that as well, which includes, uh, includes hotel room nights, the direct spend, how many people they're hiring. Okay. So we collect all that information, but it's all self-reported. And for the most part, I feel that uh, projects underreport the actual spend that they do. And I think a big reason for that is, and when, especially when it comes to feature films, unions, when it comes to IOTC and Teamsters and things like mm -hmm. that, they don't really want to be announcing how much they're, uh, they're actually spending for, um, you know, in a public, uh, public space for that kind okay. of thing. But, uh, but yeah, that's how we collect all that. So last year, 270 permitted projects, and then so all the data we collect is from those 270 projects, knowing that that's a small percentage, 10% or less, of the actual filming that takes place in the area on private property and the local studios and sound stages and everything that we have. Great. One, one last question. So I love um, the conversation about workforce and the sound stage. Maybe one of the folks you talked about, I was adamant about Lincoln and STEAM education and how the arts yeah. plays into all of that. So. Are you, have you targeted where we can get these, these workforce, you know, arts and film personnel from? And have you connected to K through 12 or groups like ACT and the other? No, so I, yeah, I have connected with ACT with Alex Harris. I've had a number of conversations with him uh, most recently, maybe, you know, three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some, uh, I, know, I know that within the county, it's a big county, but uh, St. Pete, South St. Pete is an area that we do want to target because I've had conversations with people down there who have no idea how to get involved in the industry. And that's a, a daily question that I get people either emailing or calling. It's like, I would like to get started in this industry somehow. What do I do? And so a, a big part of my job has been really you know, educating the general public on 
how to get a job and how to get started in this uh, in this particular this particular industry. So while we don't have a written plan on these are the groups that we're going to target, I do know um, you know working with uh, with ACT and others on how we can start getting the word out there. And I think a big part of it's going to be um, you know spreading the word on social media that hey the, here are programs that we're going to be that we're going to be doing, and hopefully you know those um, you know social media posts and everything are targeted towards people that will that will find it. And like I said, a lot of people, because we have had a lot of great press lately, whether it's Tampa Bay Times or Fox 13 or Bay News 9, talking about what we're doing in the industry has really um, increased the inbound communication on, on what we're doing. And so that's, uh, that's jumped up a lot. I think it's a great opportunity. And there are a lot of career paths you don't think about. Yeah. Um, there is math involved, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in putting on a show or, or a film. And to me, I just see another opportunity to connect young people to different paths that they can be successful in. So. Yeah, a lot of it is very uh, business and then, you know, blue collar work oriented. People yeah. only see the final product and you see the, the actors on screen, but you don't see the hundred people behind the scenes exactly. that are, you know, the technical experts working in the cameras and the lights and <laughs> catering and construction and art department and right. uh, film. While it's, you know, we're talking about the commerce side of it is, uh, is an art form as well. And, you know, exactly. a very, um, you know, long, long lived art form for well over a hundred years. Thank you. It was being on the set that day. It was amazing to see all of it was a like a military operation of all the different support personnel who had to do the lighting and the sound and everything. The craft services that day were a little lacking, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. But, uh, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tony, is it possible to turn a, um, a dark ballroom into a soundstage? Yes. So. If you have a dark ballroom I space, do. and you would like a big people, one, yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, that is, yes, yeah, that is possible, and it's a further conversation that we can have, um, so that when people do call my office and say, "Hey, I'm looking for soundstage space," to know that that's available, right. make, makes a makes a big difference. Because we do, it's sort of that limited. The same thing Suzanne was talking about. You can fit certain things in certain spaces. We've got a local studio, Blue Water Media, thirty thousand square feet, and that's probably the largest in the area. Um, so part of it would be, you know, how long. Do they need it for? Is it commercial that needs it just for a few days, or is it some sort of a film production that needs you know two weeks straight in that kind of thing? But having a facility where you already have hotel rooms and catering and stuff on site would make a big a big difference. Yes, Mr. Henderson. The uh, the feature films, as you say, actually say it's in Dunedin or say it's in, in Clearwater Beach and at San Pro and so forth. But the commercial business is basically pretty generic, right? It's the, it's, yes. We're getting the economic impact from that, but we're not really getting the, uh, the marketing necessarily. That we're right, yeah. The commercial phone. industry is really, you know, based on a couple of factors. One, our location. Everybody likes shooting here. And obviously, we, the season for commercials matches the season for tourist season because it's agencies from New York and everywhere else that want to come down and right. be able to continue their production, uh, and then crew base. We actually do have a really strong crew base that's been working in the commercial industry for you know, 30, 40 years here. And so there's a strong crew mm -hmm. base and equipment and that sort of thing. So it's, po it's positive from, from that perspective. But a lot of it will depend. You know, we'll get um, you know, Home Depot, Dick's Sporting Goods has been shooting a lot of their material here for the past five years or so. And so kind of once they find a space that they like, they continue to you know, go, back to that, uh, go back to that location. You have to continue providing incentives? Incentives in the commercial industry is a route I do not think we want to go down. We don't have enough money in our 90 million or so dollars coming in to uh, satisfy commercial incentives if we were to open up that. Yeah, well, that was my question, basically. Yeah. How much of this 1.7 is for None. commercial versus feature? Yeah, it's all, it's all narrative content. So no commercials are included in that. We don't need to do incentives for commercials. They'll come without it. OK, perfect, because it's well spent then. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Thank great. You. Thanks. Mayor Hibbard. Uh, just an FYI, Ruth Eckert Hall has been doing technical theater for the last five years and training kids, not film, but sound and light. Uh, it seems like an opportunity for PTEC uh, as an additional program for them, potentially. Uh, Tony, just a question about the actual um, shows and going to different uh, conventions. You know, I see the one in Cannes. That's not the Cannes Film Festival, I'm assuming. It is, uh, it's the Cannes Film Festival, it's the Marche du Film, which is the trade show that happens at the exact same time as the Cannes Film Festival. So it's the largest trade show for film in the world that happens each and every year. And it's, uh, it's basically a massive convention center. And in that convention center is everybody from around the world that is the buying and selling of 
film and television, uh, television content. There are also um, over 100 international film pavilions from film commissions around the world who are showcasing their locations to, um, you know, as a, as a destination for filming. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a country, the U.S. has lost a massive amount of production work uh, to uh, Europe and Canada over the years because uh, labor is cheaper over there. You don't have the unions like you have here. And so not having to work through the unions causes it to be cheaper. And then they, uh, on, on a national basis, most countries offer some sort of national film incentive as well. And so we've lost a lot of production to those countries. And, um, and again, they'll have uh, 100 international countries promoting their areas. And so when we go, we'll actually be taking part in the Film USA Pavilion, which promotes the U.S. as a, as a whole for filming. And really, uh, that particular trade show, you know, it's everybody from the U.S. and Los Angeles and Hollywood and everywhere else that goes there. And I'll meet more people in, you know, in the time that I'm there uh, at that one trade show than I do anywhere else throughout the rest of the year. So have we garnered business from that trade show previously? Or yes, is this a new yeah, absolutely. We have. Thank you. Yep. Mayor Brzezowski. I just wanted to say, you know, in over the last two years, I guess, we've had at least two and maybe more films happening in our city. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, you've got so many people who hate government incentives, right? I'm telling you, we have gotten more public support for this kind of thing in our city. People love it. They love scurrying around. They love going to different places and watching them shoot. They, they sign up to be extras. They absolutely love it. And so that's unusual, I think, as compared to, you know, if you're handing somebody an incentive to have a, to have a convention. You know, they don't have that same love affair, right? Well, you can't, so you can't I, see where the money's going. You yeah. can't see so the I, crew. I just and... say people love it. I have had very little, if any, complaints about it. So. Thank you. Mr. Kimball. Tony, um, we hear about uh, Atlanta. We hear about Georgia's budget. And you referred to a couple other cities. And, and what about CVBs in, in Florida? Is this competitor, the 1.7 or... Uh, with Broward or West Palm or Orlando, or you referred Miami and Orlando. Give us some comparisons. Yeah, Miami and Orlando are the two largest markets in the state. Miami is Miami. So when, you know, and that's part of, you know, the marketing when I travel and I meet people and they, they say Florida, they go, oh, Orlando, Miami. And, I'm like, and if I have to explain who we are, where we are. And so there's that, you know, educational component. Um, so Dollar wise, you know, Miami's is, is very strictly structured. It has to be a million dollar or more budget. If we did that, we would hardly get, you know, anything. You know, we're working in $400,000, $500,000 range a lot of times. Orlando doesn't have uh, an incentive at all. And I actually, uh, there was a stunt coordinator that was on set for the Radar the Bionic Dog film that came up to me and said, you need to come to Orlando and be our film commission over there because you're, you're doing great here and they're not, and we don't like what they're doing over there. Uh, but. I like my job here, so I don't plan on going to Orlando. What about Broward or, or West Palm? Or uh, so Broward has actually... Are all about the same size as we are. Yeah, so Broward actually, for the first time, has just started their film commission at the beginning of this year. Um, they didn't really have a dedicated film commission. Um, Sandy Leiterman, who was the Miami film commissioner, left Miami and is now the Broward film commissioner. And so they're building that from the ground up, and they will have an incentive program there. We don't know what that is yet. For the 1.7 that we have this year, um, I'm going to end up turning projects away because it's not enough. Um, not that I'm here hat in hand asking for, for more money in the, in the budget, but if some government body decided that there could be more money in that, in that budget, it would certainly help us to continue to bring uh, more production in the incentive from our incentive line item. A West Palm or Naples, you don't know? No, they don't have, uh, they they don't do have, not have any sort of incentive programs at all. Thank you. Yeah, we're one of the few in the state that does, which is why we're able to, you know, really take advantage of this and bring all the production here. Further questions? Do we have uh, any relation, I just, out of the kind of, I, I, uh, Whitney Fox, who used to work with the, the CVB, her and her husband were on HGTV uh, last night or night before as part of that 100-day dream home or 100-day home. And uh, they are based, I guess, in Tampa Bay. They live in, River, a lot of the homes have been in Riverview, but a lot of homes have been in South Pinellas County. Um, 
and her, her studio is in St. Pete on Beach Drive, I guess, or somewhere in that neighborhood. Do we have any relationship with those kind of shows or those like purely organic? Yeah, we get a, we get a lot of those House Hunter type shows, stuff that's the HGTV House Hunter stuff. We get a lot of the um, Discovery ID true crime stuff for the weird Florida true crimes that, uh, that take place around here. Uh, NBC shooting a documentary about uh, Terry Schiavo and interviewing some of the judges that were involved in that case. And so there was some filming taking place at the uh, historic courthouse um, as a result of that. So a lot of that reality television, again, we don't need to incentivize that. Florida is interesting enough uh, as it is. And so people come here um, you know, without, uh, without incentivizing that for, for those types of shows. OK. Very good. Thank All you, right. Tony. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to uh, break for lunch. Lunch is here. Um, it is 11.45. What do you think? How much time do you want? Well, I think we'll take a little break so that you can grab something in 15 minutes. All right, we're in recess.
We'll reconvene and be picking up with <coughs> item number six under C. Uh, Mr. Hayes, kick us off. Finish that bite. Sorry, sorry about that, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, all right, we're gonna go uh, to sports and event and community and brand engagement. We've got Craig, and uh, will lead us through uh, both sessions. Afternoon, everyone, and happy lunchtime. Um, please, by all means, enjoy. Uh, happy to, as Steve mentioned, present a couple reports here. Uh, first, we'll start off with sports and events, and uh, echoing much of what Sue's described. Earlier on the meeting side of things, sports are back, and sports are back in a big way. Um, I'm thrilled to kind of unveil some numbers here, uh, which would put us on pace for uh, record numbers here. So uh, 53 total events supported so far this year, um, close to 62,000 room nights generated. Those figures do not include uh, three big ones. So St. Pete Clearwater Elite Invitational, that's the big ESPN event in Clearwater, the Gasparilla Classic, uh, big gymnastics event at Tropicana Field and the Skyway 10K also in St. Pete. So once we get those numbers in, those uh, reports back, like I would not be shocked if that room night number's closer to 75, 80,000 room nights. Historically, our department has um, generated between anywhere 110 and 130 room nights to or 130,000 room nights. So to be sort of on the cusp of 80,000 halfway through the fiscal year, we are pacing very strong. So I did wanna give just a quick shout out to the team, uh, Caleb Peterson and uh, Julie Bolfa uh, specifically. Um, they've really stepped up here um, this past year with uh, generating all these events. Um, and it's a tribute to them. So. Um, Speaking of the team, kind of some new areas of focus that we're um, getting into uh, at the latter part of this fiscal, heading into next fiscal. Uh, we're really emphasizing events that have media components to it. So um, a few examples down there below. I just mentioned the Elite Invitational, Jersey Mike's, Spring Tennis Festival, uh, the AAC Conference, uh, baseball championships, these all generate a local impact. So room nights, direct impact, which is fantastic, but there's also a media uh, component to that as well. So working closely with BVK on, you know, those media elements, what is sort of valuable to us? Um, are these good, is this a good audience for us? And kind of at the end of the day, is this an appropriate investment level uh, for us to look into? So. Um, we're hoping to really grow that portfolio of events that offer that additional media exposure. Just real quick, as far as our sales kind of approach here, business development wise, um, when I kind of took the reins a few years ago, the, the department submitted a budget that included 48 trade shows and events uh, to travel to. We have kind of scaled back uh, quite a bit. We're, we're budgeting now for 20, maybe 21 events for next fiscal year. But um, it's, it's kind of a less is more approach. Uh, we've whittled down, we've kind of weeded out some of the events that work working for us. And the ones we are planning to attend are uh, high profile, high visibility opportunities. Um, organizers we're looking to interact with and bring their events here. So uh, the target audience is there. Um, kind of on the brand awareness side of things, since we're doing fewer events, we've got a little bit more budget from a uh, visibility standpoint to do some larger uh, either activations, host uh, dinners, clients, all that good stuff. Um, so our visibility at the fewer events will be much larger. Um, and then the remaining kind of bullet points here, advertising, uh, digital, our various sales tools, you know, this is all in support of our sales efforts. So we're constantly looking at um, kind of strategic ad placements um, from a print digital standpoint. Eddie mentioned website, you know, real excited to see 
what that looks like uh, when that comes online, um, really increasing our digital footprint. We've got our sports planning guide, um, which you know, Suze has her meetings version of that. We've got one built specifically for sports facilities, so constantly updating that. Um, we've got a great YouTube page full of facility videos that Tony and his team have helped put together. Um, so continuing to build off of those efforts and then services. So uh, certainly we offer a wide range of offerings um, and excited that we hired recently M Mariah Kaler is her name. And she's kind of stepping in here to take on the services role and excited to see what she can do from that standpoint. But that along with incentives and, um, you know, really helps just generate interest and um, in business for the destination. And fam tours. So, you know, as many fam tours that we can host, the better. Obviously, uh, introducing a client to the destination or a prospect, you know, the destination sells itself. You guys know that. Um, and then the more we can blend in our destination imagery uh, into all of our um, programming and branding and all that good stuff, the more the better. Um, to the third area here, or second area on this slide, um, and Mr. Kimball, you, you brought this up, the kind of the facility, um, you know, where we're at with some of these studies. So um, uh, let's see. Sports Facilities Advisory, so SFA, they presented December, just this past year, uh, an informational update, uh, both to the BCC and the TDC. Um, that's still a work in progress, but um, you know, just so you know, that's, that's in the work. And that's for a county-owned sports facility. And then there's the second study, which was kind of brought up uh, a little bit last year as well, which was about third-party facilities and kind of an assessment of where those stand and how they can, um, you know, any improvements that might be uh, able to be made to increase programming opportunities. So um, that 2016 study, SFA is also revisiting that. So we re-engage them from that standpoint. Um, no like hard timeline quite yet on that, but just so you're aware, those are both in the works. Um, and that's it for kind of the overview of sports and events and kind of open it for discussion. Mr. Kimball, if you had any other questions on the studies. All right. Mayor Hibbard. Love it. Just a couple questions on page 80. Um, can we get some of the underlying data for baseball, for instance, 26 events, 73,000 attendees, and 21 million in expenditures. Can we get a break out of... <clears throat> it's all right. All right, page 80. That table, I'd just like to get access to how the events in softball and aquatics, baseball, and some of the others are actually broken out. Gotcha. So, yeah, every event. I mean, are there two or three events within some of those categories that create the lion's share, or are they evenly distributed? Yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, every market segment's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'd say aquatics, the size of those events are pretty consistent between, you know, it's, it's pretty much on average. Um, softball, something like the Elite Invitational event, you know, Eddie Seymour Complex, that's going to spike the numbers quite a bit. Um, we've got a, a great partner in uh, NSA, NSA, National Softball Alliance. Uh, they do a number of kind of small, smaller type fish events, but they're doing 15 of them a year. So that, that gives us a pretty solid baseline right there uh, from a softball standpoint. Um, like something like Run Challenge, there's a big impact there, for sure. Um, and that's due to like St. Pete Run Fest, um, Skyway 10K, a couple other, like those are, those generate some pretty good um, visitation and impact there. Um, but 
yeah, I'm happy to kind of dive a little deeper and we can do like a, a breakdown of each segment and kind of the size of the different events. That's definitely doable. We capture everything in our CRM, so it's easily accessible. And then on page 81, that table, why do we break out Clearwater and Clearwater Beach? Good question. Yeah, and that's just how the, our CRM was kind of set up. And we can certainly like merge those two categories and you know eliminate Clearwater <laughs> Beach and just kind of lump them together. No, just a curious question. I mean, yeah. it's mm -hmm. all one municipality. It's not like sure. St. Pete and St. Pete Beach. Right. So. Oh, true. That's all I have, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor. So, um, I was just curious, and I don't know who to ask this, but maybe, maybe you, Steve. Um, is somewhere in here, are you reporting the, the economic value of Major League sports? You know, number of attendees, all that's the kind of things you're, you're, um, that you've got here. Because we've got several teams in this county, in the county that Business St. Pete Clearwater has financially supported. And while it's not an annual <clears throat> event, if you will, I do think it should be tracked. Well, that's why I wanted to break out to yeah. see if that was in there. No, it's not. I know it's not because I mean we, we do we have we're required to do an annual report on just spring training not minor league um mm -hmm. for the state because you know we got money from the state as well with their baseball program. And I'm I think we're at like 90 million um and I can't remember how many visitors, but I mean I just feel like we should be tracking that. And I, and I also, and it doesn't apply to sports, but we should also be tracking the other capital things that we give money to. So I'll break that out into two things. So going back to major league sports, we pick that up in the visitor profile as an activity that somebody will do. So I can go back and look at Rays specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at spring training, not necessarily Phillies or Dunedin, but spring training um, a, as a whole, and we can pull data from that. So that, that was um, A. The s second part of that related to capital, that is something that in talking with uh, ONB as well as uh, performance management, and, and we kind of had that conversation in a, in a very broad-based when we talked about capital projects of establishing or looking at what is the ROI, whether it's... Right attendance or things along that line. So keep in mind, we do that for elite events because we get reports back from that. Right. We would have to establish that for the capital in order to, to have that information. Well, at least with baseball, because I think it's a unique thing. I think, you know, because it does bring heads to beds, maybe more than, than others, if you will. Uh, it just seems like we have a whole sports department or whatever you call it and we feels like we should be you know having that information as well yeah thank you mr williams thank you mr chairman um craig good report um i think that uh, some of the information uh, we may be under reporting i know that from a golf standpoint um we host over 300 tournaments a year and uh I know that, that we can get you better information on what's happening up there. Mm -hmm. um, and this may fall under, Steve, to your comment, um, uh, just foul spar, um, the economic impact that's tracked there, our United States uh, National Women's Clay Court Championships, uh, you know, they're nationally televised, and we need to get you data on those as well. It should be included in here. It, I think it would it would make it a more impressive number in that more regard. robust. Yep. Sure. Understood. Mr. Henderson. Thank you. Um, the 150,000 room nights, is that generated through your incentive efforts or is that? Incentives, yes. Okay, because there's way more than that. For sure. That's generic. Correct. Um, a few months back, well, at least in the last 12 months, you presented and you talked about an event that you made a decision to go ahead and provide some incentive, and it came back like fivefold, it seemed mm -hmm. like. Um, 
you know, you've all heard me talk about elite events that say you never get 100% back, but somehow you got two or 300% back mm -hmm. in your in your investment there. So I question, you know, right now you the 150,000 room nights with the with the expenditure that you're outlaying for incentives is returning 150%. So okay. are we short there? Should we be doing more? Is there places we could do more incentives to bring more? Or are we to capacity? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's that's a great question. Um, it's kind of, our biggest challenge is we don't con control the venues. So it's really, okay, when is the space available? And then who can we find to kind of fill that space? So yeah, it's working with our partners and figuring out where those gaps are. To, to fill those gaps um, if they're interested. Um, so yeah, there's always opportunity out there. I think 150% uh, is um, generally like an ROI that we're looking for. So if we're, yeah, if we're paying out, um, you know, a dollar, then we're hoping to get a dollar 50 back in, right. in bed tax. So we do kind of have like a loose system in place there. Um, through our CRM and some software that we, uh, licensed through Destinations International, which is um, kind of the industry standard. They help us kind of evaluate the events based off certain inputs, um, number of spectators, number of attendee, or number of participants, uh, out of region people coming in, and it put it into, it's basically a calculator, and it'll tell us what this event is worth, and we use that to kind of base our funding off of that. My question, I guess, is are, are there events in other parts of the state of Florida we could lure <laughs> away from that location to ours? Because it yeah. seems like it's that's very lucrative. Always an opportunity there, for sure. I mean, you're totally self-supporting. Mm -hmm. Every dollar you spend brings back more to be spent somewhere else. So I there think it's go. fantastic. And the more we can add to that, and if it's through incentives, if we can, we can produce more and get that same kind of return, then let's just get that ball rolling. 10-4. Thank you. Mr. Prather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very impressive. I appreciate it. Um, when I look at some of the surprising things to me, um, tennis, for instance, with only um, four events um, with 3,000 attendees, more or less, is, is coming in behind martial arts, for instance, with 4257 attendees. When we're talking about the study of what we're going to build in this area for a sports complex do you see something that's are we missing tennis venues are we i, I feel like I we have a pretty strong oh, sorry to cut you off there i, I do think we have a pretty strong um uh inventory some inventory. options yeah exactly inventory of tennis mcmullen in clearwater certainly innisbrook um you know it's it's tough to gauge. I think this is why we're, we're bringing in SFA to really kind of pinpoint exactly where those opportunities are. Um, but to me, like tennis, it's, it's pretty strong. They're great facilities. Um, there's plenty of courts. There's a variety of courts. There's you know, different surfaces and all that. So we got some options. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge to kind of give you a straight answer there. But SFA, I think you know, they'll flush out a lot of this type of stuff with their, their um, feasibility study. And to define what we need, but also for you to target who you're gonna go chase after, more tennis exactly. tournaments, more. Exactly, we'll be, you know, based off of that information can be way more strategic in who we're kind of going after at that point. Thank you. Uh, speaking of tennis, I mean, do we still have the, uh, the women's tennis headquarters still in St. Petersburg, correct? WTA is, yes. That's I mean, is it a is it a real headquarters or is it kind of a headquarters? And I, I looked on their board one time, and they're scattered. Their executive board's kind of scattered around the country. Yeah. And I and I always seem like one since it is headquarters here that you know just kind of intrinsically we should have more women's tournaments here. Right. There's As like a host destination. Yeah. If I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, uh, they are headquartered here. Um, they. They focus on the larger tournaments. Um, the tournament that we just concluded at Innisbrook this past week was a, a United States Tennis Association event. Um, they typically will go up to $100,000 in prize money. Once you get over 100, 125, then it becomes a WTA event. Um, we have many of these events at Innisbrook, and I think we could be very helpful in introducing you to 
um, uh, those individuals, but also reporting out much better than what's reflected here. Yeah, thank you. I think that, I mean, it's fascinating to learn how each of these kind of systems work on their own um, thing. And so it's fascinating to learn that. When you're looking at facilities, and I didn't want to cut anybody if there's other questions, but when you're looking at facilities and we talk about not controlling those facilities, so how does that like structurally work? Do you look at a calendar year and you go to the city of Clearwater and say, okay, you've got X number of softball fields. What's the city calendar blocking those off? And then you go out to recruit to fill the vacancy. Is that the vacant? That's kind of the gist of it. Yeah. So like city of Clearwater, really close partners of ours. We have weekly calls with the parks and rec uh, department, um, Mike and, and Chris and the team. Um, so yeah, we have a constant dialogue. They're telling us, Hey, we'd like to host X, Y, Z events. You know, they, um, using um, Elite Invitational, again, as an example, like that's really catapulted them into this um, state where they're now known as a softball destination. They've always been known as a softball destination, but it's now drawing interest from like uh, collegiate softball, you know, tournaments. You know, we're, we have active dialogue, but, but really, yes, uh, it's City of Clearwater or whatever partner, it could be third parties, Tropicana Field, um, kind of having that dialogue going. When are you available? You know, when's your facility available? And who would you like to host? You know, if you have a preference or we, we can just can like funnel opportunities kind of ad hoc as well. Like, hey, this came up. Would you have any interest in this? And it would be interesting when we get that study back, you know, um, every, uh, not every county, but almost every county that it seems like is building one of those youth sports centers. Um, Pasco is going all in on theirs. I mean, it's it, it, to me a, kind of an odd location as far mm -hmm. as accessing anything else, but um, you know that's what they've decided to do. But when you're out talking and selling events, I mean, that's that's what I want to hear. And I guess you're going to be working with SFA, but you know, well, we would come to Pinellas, but you don't have a X facility for this tournament. Um, and is there one glaring? request that you get time after time? It's really the, the like the rectangle fields. We've got a lot of options when it comes to, to baseball, softball, and kind of the diamond fields. There's not one location where we've got 12 plus rectangle fields for a major lacrosse event, soccer, football. Um, IMG, right across the Skyway, um, they host, they're getting all that business, all these large scale events. So we're kind of picking at the scraps uh, for, uh, you know, the smaller fish when it comes to those like field type sports. And, and um, I go to a conference every year. It's in the same hotel in Orlando. And the same time we go to that, there's always the, the ballroom is the, the big ball. We're in the side rooms, but the big ballroom is full of uh, dance competitions. Mm -hmm. And we don't seem to get those same kind of competitions here. Is it simply a venue again or some other factor? We, yeah, um, we're working on kind of a cheer slash dance sort of market segment. So we uh, actually just hosted um, like an Irish dance competition down in St. Pete. Again, we're starting small, but yeah, it's it's dependent on like banquet room space and hotels availability if we're going to go like after some of these smaller type dance competitions. But there's very large scale opportunities that would require something like a Tropicana field. So yeah, there's, there's opportunities out there. We're kind of, you know, looking into that uh, segment specifically. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, I remember when we, we built the stadium and we didn't have a team. And so the local folks, uh, we were pretty hungry and we went after every event we could get and hosted <laughs> hockey before we had the lightning hockey games in there, um, uh, football games of every kind, uh, the Davis cup, uh, mm -hmm. in St. Petersburg years ago, Mr. Mayor. So it doesn't seem like some of those kind of big events that we get with our facilities because we have a, a team that's filling up the, the venue. So right. um, anyway, Mayor. I was just going to add to something that you made me think of back to my high school kid sports days where we were traveling all the, all the time. Um, but it's interesting because high school sports – even in this state, just this state, forget out-of-state people, but this state, 
their final tournaments tend to be somewhere in Orlando because it's a central place and they have a lot of facilities. Um, I think in, even in that world, and, and when I say high school, I'm not even talking about just the high school. I'm talking about like, what is it? The, there's a, a national high school federation. I'm not saying the name's right, but mm -hmm. there's several organizations that do big tournaments that you can supplement your kid's high school sport you know, attendance with, and they're national, and but they all tend to be either the wild world of sports and or the uh, what's the Spur Arena or whatever it is in Orlando. <coughs> they all seem to be in that area because it's central. We are still considered Central Florida, and we could be very competitive in that. Now, mm. how many of that is it? Well, they've got an association for wrestling. They've got an association for football. They've got a national association for baseball. I mean, they've got a lot of different things. So I, I think, um, and parents, you know, they're they're going to travel. They're going to bring the whole darn family, and they're getting hotel rooms because <laughs> that's what you do. Are you going to tell your kids you can't go to the tournament? No. So I, I think there's an opportunity there as to whether we need a facility for that or or it's these things, but I think we can be competitive. Mr. Kimball. Um, <clears throat> just a few comments. Um, and for example, Mr. Chairman, in due respect, uh, dance and, and some of those, um, they take your facilities, but maybe they're not the spenders for food and beverage and, and rooms and everything too. So hotels know who spends and who doesn't spend and, and what they can commit their space to and all also. And what happened in Orlando, they built big facilities because they had the hotels all the way around it. And so it helps fill that, that whole void for when they need it at certain times. So they invest big dollars to do that. Um, one of the things I didn't see on here, unless it's called water sports, is what are we doing to develop um, sailing and, and intercoastal competition and all those facilities on water um, that we have some facilities, I know, and, and is there other things that we need to be adding more to or, or, or uh, going after, um, or this doesn't show it, maybe that we do do? We have supported, yeah. So like the, uh, that chart, sorry, I believe it was page 80 you mentioned. Um, there are some other sports um, that are not included in that sort of uh, overview there, but... Uh, but yeah, we work with the Clearwater Sailing Center, same down in St. Pete. Um, there, you know, there are some ongoing conversations on hosting some international type events. Um, I think it was F15, um, kind of under 18 sailing world championships. So yeah, lots of conversations going on. They're very expensive. Oftentimes, um, you know, they're asking us to pay for shipping of hundreds of boats to the destination which is a, a pretty yeah. lofty bill. So you can't, yeah, that's fine, but. So yeah, like we've kind of, a look, we, we're definitely evaluating things and it, um, something like a world championship would have potentially some media elements to it. So once we get a bit more information what that looks like, that might help justify some of the funding that's being requested from us. Media is the other part of my question. Um, and when we do Outback Bowl, uh, one of the things, there's a beach day in Clearwater. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple other tournaments of football have media days where you broadcast back to, to home television areas and, and uh, that type of thing. Are we doing that for other sports or just those two big ones? Or I was thinking of like the women's softball that comes in February and all. Do we do that effort? We have had, not like a beach day, we have had like a welcome sort of reception uh, for the elite invitational. So hosting all the teams out at Coachman Park, throwing sort of a, a, a big reception out yeah. there. Um, but nothing quite to the scale that like Outback Bowl is. Um, and then Gasparilla Bowl, they're kind of using that template as well. So down in uh, at Treasure Island, sort of emulating that template of having a beach day and having the bands and the, the teams and coaches come out. But um, but no, that's that's definitely, you know, worth exploring. I You know, if there's a TV component 
and we can get our beaches on the TV, yeah, it's, let's explore that, see what that maybe, looks like. Maybe we could team up you and media a little bit uh, on some of those things uh, at exactly. that time. Steve, Steve, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just gonna say, um, watching this year's final of uh, the Elite Softball Invitational, where my Knowles were taking on um, um, uh, UCLA in the final. I literally, it seemed like every five minutes there was a TV spot for St. B. Clearwater. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, you had the brand of the destination on the fences and you were getting the TV coverage there. I was, I was just like, and Michelle yeah. Smith is talking about it. Yeah, and those are the things that on the sports side, when Craig said, you know, how do we get, you know, especially when we're looking at events that have TV exposure. Um, it's like the Jersey Mike's uh, basketball tournament um, that, you know, again, they had some national teams that are here, but yet, you know, when they said, hey, it was going to be on TV, I thought it was going to be like, you know, streaming TV, just whatever. It was on CBS Sports Streaming. And it's like, so there's so much of that content now that, again, we can look at those, those sports and say, hey, how, how do we get that visibility? What can you give us if we're helping you uh, uh, with that? And then on the sailing, I, I agree on the sailing. You know, we're surrounded by water. Um, and, you know, the, the fact is that, you know, I have a buddy of mine from northern Michigan that trained down here. Uh, when he was wanting to be part of the America's Cup team. Uh, my compadres, where I came from prior to here, just announced a major initiative with uh, America's uh, Cup, one of the racing teams. And it's like, okay, those are things that get you that visibility. And whether it's in Clearwater, it's in downtown St. Pete, it's our water. Yep. And those are the things that I think, you know, you know, we can look at growing and doing more of. Um, it, it, especially as we see the interest here of people wanting to be a part of that. And Phil, you know, to that point, it may not be a one-to-one -one match, you know, on a return. It may be something that we build to, but it's going to take some investment over time and some energy to make, make that happen. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we had, uh, the CVB had involvement in it, but last year um, at the St. Pete Pier, there was a, a motor boat. I don't know what kind it was. Powerboat. Powerboat, thank you. Uh, races off the pier, um, and it ha I don't. And I think it was Fox Sports carried it, um, and the footage was incredible. I don't know anybody that was there knew anything about the race or any of the racers, but um, the video was incredible of those shots. And for the sailing, um, unless unless I'm, my memory is really gone, Mr. Mayor, uh, sailing is the only national championship that the University of South Florida holds, and it's out of the St. Pete folks. So. Um, there should be some natural tie-ins there. I was just gonna, I was just gonna add to that. You know, again, just from some personal experience about sailing, um, you know, many of us have yacht clubs or boat clubs, right, in our communities. Um, we call ours our boat club because we don't want to. There's nothing pretentious about Dunedin. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'll give you an example of something, and I, I, I know that Clearwater, because we've partnered with Clearwater's Yacht Club many times on different things, there are races that these different clubs do, local, right? But people travel to do those races. But one year, we, we had, well, several years, and they live right on Island Estates, this youth brother and sister team was in, in the America's Cup, and they trained out of Dunedin Boat Club and Clearwater Yacht Club many, many years and were sponsored. I mean, that would have been a, the perfect kind of thing for us to go follow. But I think making some re you know, relationships with all the various boat, yacht clubs, whatever they're calling themselves, because I think they're already doing some pretty cool things. And, and see if there's something there to build on to see if it catches. Just, just a thought. Yeah, it's the railways. Uh, Zach and Paige, she got a gold medal, he got a silver. Uh, we had Olympic trials out at the Clearwater Sailing Center this past year. So um, in two different classes of boats, along with the offshore boating, which we've had for 13 years, I think. So, I, We have talked about so many things today. <laughs> uh, and what we can spend our money on. I'm 
hoping that when the strategic plan is done and we have that conversation about the final product, to me, one of the most important components of a strategic plan is a funnel and a filter for how you spend money. Because there are unlimited great ideas, but you have to have a hierarchy to triage where you're going to spend limited resources. And I just think that's gonna be critically important going forward, especially as these reserves have grown. It's wonderful, great problem to have, but let's make certain that we're you know, getting the most bang for our buck. That's my editorial comment because I have to leave at 115. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right. Now that you've solved that, Craig. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the chambers yet, so stand by. <laughs> All right, uh, community and brand engagement, kind of pivoting here. Um, just very excited and encouraged by um, some of the recent dialogue and collaboration with Katie on the marketing side, BVK, um, planning and executing some of uh, some strategic activations. Um, so kind of taking their lead on these strategic markets, developmental versus maintenance, but you know, just in the past three, four months, we've executed um, three separate events here. So on the left there, and apologies for the, the clutter on the, um, the slide there, but, um, so an activation in Chicago in December at Lincoln Park. Uh, the middle four slides were in Nashville end of uh, February for the NHL uh, outdoor series game. Um, and then Fiesta in the Park just a couple weekends ago in Orlando, Florida. But just excited about these out-of-market activations, alignment with the strategic vision that KD and, and BBK are working on, you know, we're not going to show up as a one-off kind of in a, a random market. Everything that we're doing out of market is, uh, is perfectly aligned. Uh, target audiences, the timing, the messaging, all of that is to support kind of the, the overall marketing mission. Um, and then beyond that, we do... I mean, you can't miss us around town. We have so many local events, um, certainly supporting all the elite events, a lot of our major uh, sporting events that come in uh, as well. Um, we're available to any of the other departments um, to, to support and be an extra resource for them if they're looking to amplify their, their branding, their messaging, we are there to support. And just a handful of examples there, there's at least another two dozen events that we um, have done, and that, that's just in this fiscal year. Looking ahead, um, kind of the, what I feel like is the next like natural step in the evolution of the activations program is, all right, we've got our branding down to sort of a science um, in our operations. How can we start to include um, other partners in our footprints? So, uh, it could be something as simple as, okay, come work the booth with us, or we'll hand out some of your collateral. That's easy peasy, but we can be way, way more creative uh, and have more kind of integrated uh, approach to how we involve our partners. So excited to kind of explore that here in the next year. Sustainability initiatives, uh, absolutely looking forward to continuing our momentum with the Unwind and Be Kind campaign. All the beach cleanups we've been doing the uh, past few months, uh, partnership with Keep Pinellas Beautiful, any other you know sustainability partners uh, that we're talking with as well. But um, and then how can we take that message kind of to the next level here and start to integrate into our activations? Um, and one idea was to you know we certainly invest in promotional products. Okay, well let's find some sustainable products that we can be distributing and just tie everything together there. Going to skip the third bullet point and hope Julie doesn't notice or miss. <laughs> I kid, I'll be right back to that. Um, 
skip into the value of tourism campaign. So really this is, to me, a top priority uh, next year. We do a fabulous job of engaging um, tourists in market, out of market. One thing we're somewhat lacking is a, a message geared towards the locals. Um, so we are actively looking at a value of tourism campaign. So when we're at an event, if we're at a Valspar and we have a tourist come up, great. We've got a message for you. If we have a local come up, awesome. We've got a message for you as well. And um, to be more than just kind of collateral based, informational, we've, it's gonna be on brand too. So we're gonna make it fun. Uh, we're gonna make it engaging and all that good stuff. Um, some really good concepts we're kind of kicking around right now. No hard details there, but that just know that that's kind of in the works. And then kind of circling back here on the chamber funding program. So yeah, Mayor Bajowski, you're spot on. The 500 grand allocated does not come out of my budget. Um, great question. I, I, I kind of looked at Terry maybe from like a historical perspective, but um, but we, our team, Kristen Corin specifically manages the program, does a fabulous job um, just kind of administering the deliverables and all that good stuff. And Steve, her and I are always kind of looking to refine what that looks like. Um, but yeah, kind of any questions on that front? Um, so I was looking at some of the past budget. It, it, I'd like... How do you base what you give each chamber? Like the amount, is it all the same? Are they all the same? Or is it the size if they have a visitor center? I mean, what, what do you use to determine the amount they get? It's a system that's really just been kind of grandfathered in. So it kind of predates, oops, sorry. Predates Steve, myself, Kristen. Right, no, no, I know. So it's, there's a lot of kind of history there. We haven't quite cracked the code on what like a new formula would look like. We've, we've asked the chambers, what would make sense to you? Kind of consulted, try to get their feedback. Um, kind of at the end of the day, we did increase the funding a couple years ago, kept it flat throughout the, the pandemic and continuing to do so, um, at least in this request. So, um, so yeah, I think chambers, I mean, feedback that I've received is pretty well received. Is it always, um based on like them having a visitor center because I mean that used to be some of it and then some of it was maybe if they did marketing or something. There's yeah a promotional kind of budget and then yes there there's kind of a um Mr. Hayes might be able to help us out visitor here. center allocation too. Fire away. I'm just saying I, I know that I mean, we have a visitor center in our chamber because they happen to be strategically located and they're extremely busy. Mm -hmm. I mean extremely busy. Um, and it's right in the downtown on the corner of Main Street and Alt 19. So they have a hard time. They have to get volunteers to work that, but they get a hard time, especially now. I mean, you can't even hire people, let alone get volunteers for things. Um, you know, and that type of thing, money, more money would be certainly helpful. Um, I mean, I think we give the same amount that you guys are giving, and it's very small very small so I just like that to be reviewed I obviously we're not here to solve the world's problems and how you your formula but I do think chambers could use more and then when I look at five hundred thousand dollars given the size of our budget I mean I, I'm just saying it's not much it isn't much and you are correct there's a number of variables that go into it having a visitor center is one but also how often is that visitor center open yeah where the vis visitor center is you know because again there's um you know you could have a, yeah. a center and it be on the fifth floor yeah and but, i think our visit i think we get like 10 or fifteen thousand a year right annual so when then, i look at that i'm thinking they have a seven day a week operation why are they only getting 10 <laughs> to fifteen thousand out of 500 i don't know so we're going to be re-looking at that formula or what makes up that so that, again, looking at assistance to the visitors, programs to help visitors, especially within your own local community. Um, so we're open to the ideas, but realizing what it was before 
and we haven't quite figured out how it got to that, but changing it so it makes more sense. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else? And Mayor, I spent, uh, <laughs> when I was in college, I spent every Saturday working at the St. Pete Chamber Visitor Center on Olmerton Road uh, in that little mobile unit out there. Um, so, uh, well, comparative to pay now, yes, it was volunteer based, you know, after I paid for gas to drive all the way out there. Yeah. And it was pretty bad. Huh? It was, <laughs> yes. Thank all you. Right, thank you, Craig. What's next? All right. Next up, uh, leisure travel, Rosemary Payne. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So let me give you a quick recap on leisure travel to start with. <clears throat> we continue, leisure travel continues to lead all market segments for room nights coming to Pinellas County. Domestic leisure business has already surpassed pre-pandemic levels, and domestic tour operators are predicting record sales to our destination this fiscal year. 70% of leisure travelers, these were consumers in the US, Canada, UK, and Germany, they were polled by the website trip.com, said they plan to spend more on travel in 22-23. Visitors are willing to pay more for a hotel room in St. Pete Clearwater, and that is evident in our strong average daily room rates and rev par. Some trends we're looking at in the leisure travel area. Leisure travelers wanna take longer vacations and they want to upgrade their vacation experiences. It's been a long time since they've been on vacation, so they're ready to get back out there traveling. Responsible travel is a new trend as well. Visitors becoming more purposeful and intentional about how and why they are traveling. People are also celebrating missed milestones since the pandemic began. Multi-generational or extended family leisure travel is on the rise. Other trends to watch our gas prices, the cost of airline tickets, and inflation. On the TV news last night, they said that airline travel is booming right now. But all of these factors, what will they do to this market um, in the coming months and next year as well? Will we once again see a trend in vacationing closer to home? Travel advisors are now travel advocates. According to Focus Right Research, which is part of the North Star Travel Group, the travel agency community, both leisure and corporate, is still the biggest consumer of travel products and is thriving alongside online travel agencies, OTAs, and supplier direct channels. The business going through agents is healthy and solid for the foreseeable future. It's quite possible that the travel ecosystem is finding a happy medium with travel advisors OTAs, and Consumer Direct all coexisting peacefully. Just to touch on the international markets, research is telling us that visitor numbers from these markets will not return to pre-pandemic levels until 2024. Moving forward into fiscal year 23, the Leisure Travel Department will be refocusing our sales plan on the travel trade. Our goal is to build on established relationships, relationships support new product development, and provide increased brand awareness to grow room night production through these partnerships. Working with our domestic, Cana domestic and Canadian tour operator partners, receptive tour operators that, by the way, have a growing domestic portfolio of customers since the pandemic, as well as strong international clients, and travel advisor networks, the Leisure Travel Department will have the resources necessary to capitalize on new growth opportunities with these partners. So let's take a look at the travel advisor segment. The Leisure Travel Department will continue to work with key travel advisor networks like AAA, CCRA, which is home-based travel agents, and ASTA, which is the American Society of Travel Advisors. We will look for co-op sales initiatives with partners like Visit Florida and, and, and in-state DMO partnerships. We will be developing a domestic travel advisor training portal for continued online education on the St. Pete Clearwater area. And Visit St. Pete Clearwater has a new travel advisor, 
or travel advisor research tool from TravelClick called Agency 360. This report will allow us to track GDS, which is the global distribution system that every travel agent has. It will allow us to track GDS production from travel agencies across the U.S. and build on these relationships to increase revenue from these key clients. Looking at domestic and receptive tour operators, Visit St. Pete Clearwater will participate in tour operator product launches, key trade shows like U.S. Travel's IPW, and visit Florida's Florida Huddle, Apple Leisure Group's Ascend Conference, and Delta Vacations University. We will also seek out marketing initiatives with partners like Hotel Beds and Bonatel, and will assist these partners with challenges in our destination, like inventory availability and rates that extend beyond 2023 for longer range bookings. In Canada, we will build on our Brand USA marketing campaigns and support Brand USA's Discovery Platform, which is their online training program for international travel advisors. We will continue to work closely with Visit Florida's office in Canada, which is Vox International. And we will be in market for sales missions. I actually leave on Monday for my first sales mission to Canada in two years, so looking forward to that. We'll also be in market for product launches with our key tour operators, <clears throat> excuse me, tour operator partners. And we will also support Canadian Airlines service into the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport and the Tampa International Airport. The leisure team will also support all market initiatives by creating and executing inbound FAM educational visits. The leisure team will also be the liaison with our international offices in the UK and Central Europe. And last but certainly not least, our travel industry partners. The Leisure Travel Department will continue to provide local tourism partner engagement with travel, travel agents and tour operators through sales opportunities that allow for partners to maximize their exposure to build new business at travel shows and industry events throughout the fiscal year. We also want to create a customer advisory group this will be made up of key travel advisors and tour operators that will be in market for our leisure travel forum. The whole premise behind this forum is to evaluate the current strategies outlined to review our strategic plan and develop short and long term goals moving forward for the leisure travel department. So that is my very brief presentation. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. If, if I might add, um, with Rose and her team, they travel quite a bit, but they're out talking to the folks that can talk us up. And the one element that uh, a tool that we got her and her team this year with Agency 360 is they literally can go in and, and as an example, we can look at the top 100 travel agencies that book uh, Pinellas County. And we can look at the dollar volume, we can look at the room nights, we can look at what type of business that it is, um, and we know where they're located. So when they go to a show, and I'll use Chicago as an example, they go there, they know here are the top agencies to go talk to. Now, they may be corporate, it may be corporate travel, but we also know that folks Coning, you know, if you've heard the term leisure, combining business and leisure, we have a certain cell there. So it's... And that it, report actually does let us break out just leisure agencies as well. So it's a, a great tool which allows us to be more focused. And then for our all of our industry partners, now they can go with us or they'll also know what markets work. So again, very targeted. You know, back in the day when I was doing these types of shows, I mean, you'd go to a show and it was all, well, we didn't have computers back then. So, uh, you know, you're, you had everything by, a, you know, keeping track on paper. Now it's very specific. And so it really helps target what we're doing and going through and how, and how we're doing it. So I, I appreciate all Rose and her, her team that are doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Is your department shrunk? Pardon? Is your personnel in your department, has that gone down? It has gone down <coughs> by one person. Just by we, one? we had um, Michelle 
Poyette, she was more of a admin and she was our FAM specialist. So if we were to grow the department back once those FAMs start to come back, I would like to see us maybe have another person that could help support those because the FAM visits are so important for these travel advisors to see the destination. A lot of them have not seen all of the new things that have happened since 2020. So it'll be more important than ever moving forward. We actually, after IPW this year, which is in Orlando, we have four FAMs coming at the same time because so many people want to see the destination. So we're excited about that opportunity. Are you missing out on any shows because you're lagging personnel? We've really looked at the shows and I think that we have a really, really strong um, set of where we need to be. Again, we're, we're doing some things like Craig and his team are doing. We're going into some of these markets and Craig's going in with an activation that's talking to the consumers. And I'm going in and I'm talking to the travel agents about the destination. And then we've got advertising going into those markets as well. So we're kind of trying a layered approach in some of our key markets to really um, build that relationship with that travel agent community, travel advisor community in those markets. I don't feel like we're missing anything. I was only asking because you're saying that travel advisor now is being used more. You know, so much went to people booking through OTAs and on their own. And we're looking. It was so looking, easy to do on yeah, their own. We're also looking at working smarter and not harder. <clears throat> so, like CCRA, which is a home-based travel advisor network. Steve and I had a conversation. Was there some way that we could reach those travel advisors digitally? and not have to be at a number of different shows. So we're looking at those opportunities as well. In Canada, um, Eddie and I just had a conversation with a, a, par a digital partner that we've worked with domestically. They have a program in Canada as well. Is that another way that we can, um, in a different way, reach those you know, travel advisors or consumers in those markets? Yeah. That was my next question about Canada, since you've kind of taken that. We used to have a Kimberly back in the day representing Canada and we eliminated right. that. Canada, the landscape in Canada has changed a lot. Um, we have very few tour operators. A lot of them have, have merged into um, other organizations, have a super, super strong partner in the Visit Florida team on the ground in Canada. Um, we are in Canada probably a, three or four times a year. So again, we're hitting all the major product launches. Um, we did lose one of our major tour operators coming out of the Canadian market, um, Sunwing. Um, yeah. But they are looking at maybe coming back in some way, shape, or form. We're also talking to um, Canadian Jetlines, which is another airline that's talking to PIE. So I think, we're, I think we've got Canada pretty well covered. Um, I feel real comfortable with where we're at. And we also have several different opportunities to take partners with us into those markets, especially into Canada. It seems like Canadians would really want to get out because they've really been... We, we, just gotta, we just got to get a few more of these um, um, hoops you have to jump through. I know I've got, a, I've got an app that's called Enter Canada, so I have to do a few things before I leave on Monday just so I can get in. And, of course, I, then I have to have my, my evaluation before I can come back to the States. So as soon as everything is wide open, I think we're going to see the Canadians really excited to come back. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Rose. All right, next up, uh, Latin America, Andrea. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to begin my presentation with a brief, um, showing you a brief highlights of the fiscal year 22 and what the department has accomplished. Um, we continue to provide virtual destination presentations and maintain our presence in crucial trade shows, virtual and in person. In fiscal year 22, we have executed a sales mission in Mexico, participated in four trade shows, provided 11, actually now is 12 destination presentations, and trained 1,561 trade professionals. We met our goal on the sales plan, page number two, we met our goal of increasing the percentage of two operators that focus on and promote our destination by 6%. So right now in Latin America, we went from 62 to 66, two operators that promote a destination, create packages, um, promote a destination on their channels and social media channels and also on the landing page. The department will continue to seek opportunities to promote the destination training program on the Brand USA Discovery Platform. We have this program in the BDBR, the Brazil domain, and the MX, the Mexico domain as well. And page two, I share with you some of the numbers that we have. 
The department has evaluated the markets and has collaborated with the advertising department to create ads presence in the crucial trade shows editions. In fiscal year 22, we have welcomed two frame groups. And right now, I have, um, I have some familiarization groups already on the books that will start coming to our destination in the month of May, all the way to August 2022, that I would like to um, share with you. We have four trade familiarization groups. The first one arrived in May. It's American Airlines Central American Familiarization Group. Uh, they're bringing the 10 travel devices to our destination, and we are sharing this fan group with Visit Tampa Bay and Bosch Gardens. FRT, we are welcoming them twice in May and one group in August. FRT is um, the two operator sites located in Brazil. The receptive site is located in Orlando. We have a great relationship with FRT, and so does Visit Florida. And they continue to also now focus on the receptive side. It's also in the markets of Mexico and Colombia. We are welcoming our inter two operator, a Brazilian two operator, um, post IPW, with the 10 travel devices from Brazil to visit our region. We're also welcoming five media and digital influencer visits, also from the month of May all the way to June, starting with Ana Paula Garrido Brazilian Media in partnership with Visa Florida. La Opinion, it's media from Argentina, que hacemos hoy, media from Uruguay, and Ideas da Mala and Dica Indica, two Brazilian influencers that we are welcoming to our destination to promote the brand awareness in partnership with Visa Florida. Now I would like to um, review with you, for your approval, the Latin America Fiscal Year 23 sales budget. I would like to present for your approval the participation in seven trade shows, four sales missions, and two client events. On the budget page, you will notice a column other. In this column, we'll support co-op programs in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. In collaboration with Visit Florida, or direct programs with the two unreceptive operators. Still, we will dedicate this column to digital collateral and sales implementation in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico when we cannot participate ourselves. And I will talk a little bit more about that, this new initiative in our sales plan. Now I would like to share with you some of the marketing initiatives co-op programs that we have happening right now in the destination. Starting with the Visit Florida Co-op Airlines Colombia, it's a B2C campaign. You will notice as I do a rundown of the campaigns that we have, our focus is the trade and also the consumers. And we take advantage of working with Visit Florida in partnership with Visit Florida and Brand USA for larger brand awareness. The Brand USA Brazil multi-channel co-op, it's a B2C campaign and it includes the Expedia booking platform. Brand USA Price Travel Mexico. Price Travel is the largest two operator slash wholesaler in Mexico. It's a B2C campaign. Visit Florida Agas2 Brazil Co-op. Agas2 is a unique two operator in Brazil. They have the B2C and B2B. So they are two operator, but they also provide their own travel devices. Um, and we have a partnership with them through Visit Florida. The Visit Florida, Orienta, and Diversa Brazil Co-op programs, those are B2B campaigns, very small campaigns, but will provide us the brand awareness that we need in the market. The Brand USA Mexico and Colombia Expedia Co-op program, it's a B2C campaign, and will start in about three weeks, and will run all the way to the end of this fiscal year. As you can see, we are covered between the B2B and the B2C campaigns. Bonus added and added value that we also received from some of the campaigns that the leisure department has signed up. For example, the Beds Online International Co-op Program, they included the Latin market, meaning includes Argentina, Colombia, every country in Latin America with the exception of Brazil and Mexico. Beds Online is the two operator for the wholesaler hotel beds. And another added value, we are receiving, um, it is the hotel beds domestic program that includes the Americas, including Canada, in every country in Latin America, and this time they are including Brazil and Mexico. Now I would like to present to your approval the Latin America Fiscal Year 23 sales plan. I actually provide in the first page of the sales plan a breakdown of the department, the sales and manager of the department, and their responsibilities. The team has excelled in recognizing opportunities to provide a virtual training presentation. I share with you on page two a breakdown by fiscal year. The Latin leisure trends in the digital, many, and many of our trade clients have refocused the booking platforms to accommodate the travel advisor and consumer expectations in Latin America. 
The department will be able to take opportunities of programs dedicated to the booking platform, actually including also that other column for the sales budget as well, that will include lots of like co-op programs and some digital brochures. We will continue to seek opportunities to educate international travel trade in our destination and promote sustainable tourism. We will increase the number of trained trade professionals by 20%, and you will find those data and those numbers on page three of the sales plan. We will focus support and increase two and receptive operators, OTAs, in Latin America's critical markets that promote St. Pete Clear Water by 6%. Now I propose for fiscal year 23 that I'll have going from 70, uh, two operators to 74 to promote our destination. We will continue to create and negotiate incentive campaigns in Mexico and Brazil to increase the number of trained trade professionals in the BR and MX domain by 10%. I also have those data for your review on page three. We will build a robust destination presence with the trade media. We will identify opportunities and focus on special edition trade shows. We plan to create two Spanish and two Portuguese brochures for the fiscal year 23. The goal three in our sales plan is the new initiative that we have for fiscal year 23 to present for your approval. This goal is an initiative that will manage and direct sales implementation and Latin America's key markets support the team's sales and marketing efforts. We will use and establish a representation company to represent some jobs in our markets when the team cannot participate. For example, when a tour operator puts together a one-day uh, trade workshop to train and pr promote, promote uh, all the packages, and we are unable to visit the country just for one-day workshop, that's when we can use the support of the sales implementation. It's not a full-time representation, but supports only when needed. The team will train the representatives and monitor the work for all the selected potential jobs. We will carefully evaluate all press visits, requests, and the reach, page views, quality, and quantity of articles, stories, and posts. We will upload media returns in the CRM system for destination partners' access and track media views and reach. In fiscal year 23, we plan to deliver a 10% increase in the number of social media views over fiscal year 22, and I share with you on the last page of the sales plan some current data that we have in brand awareness of social media. And finally, for goal five, from the sales plan fiscal year 23, we will continue to identify opportunities to increase brand awareness and visitation through collaboration with VSPC departments and local airports. Does anyone have any questions for me? Questions? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chair, the next item on the agenda is executive sales, which is page 129. And essentially, that would be any travel related to myself or, and you'll see on there, it could be a staff member, it says CMO, and that would be a uh, revamped position within Visit St. Pete Clearwater, which would be a chief marketing officer. So this is industry-related shows that we would go to, and then also um, anything that we're out there supporting in terms of sales or other departments. So as an example, um, if uh, um, um, Andrea were to say, you know, hey, we're going to be doing these things in South America, in Brazil, and, and Argentina, then I could help support them. But then also if we need to take other leadership, i.e. the chairman, uh, to go experience some of our markets, they're able to go through and do, go through and, and do that. So um, again, it's um, mainly support of the departments, but also then industry um, uh, programs that were involved. At, you know, example, uh, going to the governor's conference on tourism or something related to destinations international. Any any questions on that? All right. Um, under international marketing, and on that. If, since I don't have the clicker, maybe, oh yeah, if you could get that, thank you. I wasn't sure if in the back they could do that as well. Thanks, 
All right, so for um, international marketing, um, what I did essentially is we have a contract with um, Brewster, who handles the UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia. We have another contract with Kaus Media Services, which handles Germany and West Europe. Those are both new uh, with this, within this fiscal year. Um, I went through and took their whole, the plan that they have where they've identified events to attend, um, any press or influencer trip, trade fam trips, and then any brand partnership and campaigns that they're proposing that we do. Um, I've indicated how many we're doing by those um, uh, uh, different markets. The detail is that actually in the book. I, and our contract with Rooster is 360000 Our contract with Kaus is 300000 I do want to go through and mention that when it comes down to advertising, we have dollars that's coming out of the advertising um, uh, at a Katie's budget for Brand USA. And with Brand USA, we're able to go through and tag spots, and then we get added by or bonus, uh, we get disc, uh, discounts added by. We're really able to extend the dollar, and we can use that for any of the advertising that we're doing with them, especially if it's with um, other partners. Um, and then this is also an area where we would work closely with not only uh, Visit Florida, but also our friends across the Bay with Visit Tampa Bay. Um, so to go through and do a campaign. So right now we have something that is um, uh, being put together for Edelweiss. We have something very similar being put together for um, uh, Eurowings Discover, which is the Lufthansa flight. Um, so again, it's just that that money then would come out of that brand U, uh, brand USA budget, not out of our uh, reps budget. But um, again, various times that they're going to be over here, getting customers over here, working with uh, Rose and Rose and her team, but also McKenzie, if it happens to in, involve any of the, of the press. And again, relatively simple from our international firms. Um, and as we get closer to the fiscal year start, we'll have more specific details, especially as they get things that are happening within their own uh, countries and or uh, regions. Any questions on that? I assume that we have, um, with each of these firms, we have kind of a, a key contact or lead person with each of these. That's our go. I mean, I'm going back to years past where we had one person in the UK office and we had one person in, in the German office. Um, but how, how are we set up here? Um, so on that, we have, um, we have a key contact, but literally calls are like every other week. And on that, there's a team. Okay. Because um, it's all done by Zoom and it is beyond the Brady Bunch look. So, but that's because they've got somebody. Because what we did in the past is we had somebody handling sales, we had somebody handling marketing. Well, now it's that office is handling sales and marketing. So they've got their salespeople on there, they got their marketing people on there. And so with our staff, corresponding staff. So it's really multiple people involved. There is one point of contact. But again, it's a, it's a team effort. Good. OK. Uh, the last um, item on the agenda then would be decision packages. Um, and the first one that's in there uh, involves Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And in this case, we would be adding two intern positions uh, that would be good for each semester, and a semester being fall, spring, and summer. The positions would be shared with the various departments based on need as well as ex experience desired. The cost is only for the pay, which is on an hourly basis. Uh, there's no benefits. There's no other things that go with it. Um, but, you know, again, a need, you know, for the the departments is to have the intern. We have not had one for a, a while, I've, if I understand correctly. Um, so this would be a, a great way to introduce people to what we do, but also help in specific projects and um, activities. Uh, little side note, how I got my start in this business. I had no idea what a CVB was, but I interned at one. And um, so it was probably the best experience I ever had. And so if we can help grow talent, 
and that understand what we do. That might be someone that may want to join our team or another team, but we can help certainly showcase uh, this area. And we would work with uh, our local universities and colleges uh, to find appro appropriate people. Um, and I probably should have had, asked you this question when you did the overview, but um, for like, except for during COVID, I mean, since I've been on this board, there's been a number of open positions. What What is the plan? And you may have said it earlier and I missed it, but yeah, what, because I mean, and, and back under the other director, I mean, it was still, they were all open positions and nobody was seeming to rush to fill them. So I, I guess if we're not gonna fill them, should they be on there? Um, to answer your question, so let me kind of just back up quickly. So right now there are nine positions open yeah. at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Three of those positions <clears throat> were prior to my arrival. Yes, so I know, was, I know. They've just been there for a long time. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have one that is right now in the process of being filled. And then we have one that just opened effective last Friday. And then we had four within the last 12 months. All of those positions, well, Eight of those positions, because one's already in progress, um, will be filled as we go through. And a perfect example would be is I've set aside, you know, we're going to have a chief marketing officer. That would be one of the positions. That's the VP of marketing, is that what you're looking for? Yeah. yeah, because yeah. that one has been open. Let's say I think I've been on the board of maybe four years, I don't know. And it's been open since I walked in the door. Yeah, so it, that's an example. Uh, second is you know, uh, going through and helping out on the PR side in terms of content creation and communications. Again, as we do more outbound, both internally, externally, being able to, to have that. Um, so, so again, plan is as we go to next fiscal year, those positions would be filled. Okay, thank you. And then the, the, last, uh, the last item on decision packages there was, um, was under Creative uh, Pinellas. And on that, they had a total of uh, five different decision packages. Two of those uh, were being suggested to be funded through the Tourist Development Fund. And then three of those that would be funded through General Fund Transportation Fund. Um, we had a converse, We had a meeting with Barry yesterday, kind of running through the budget. I, I understand he wants to have a better understanding of some of the direction related to Creative Pinellas, but I thought it would still be good today to talk about, especially the, any of the decision packages that are related to the Tourist Development Fund. We currently are funding Creative Pinellas to the tune of uh, 797,360, which is the same amount that we funded last year um, in, in fiscal year 22. Um, and then any of the decision packages from there would raise raise that, that dollar amount. I know that, I think she's here, Barbara. Yeah, Barbara is here. You know, if there were questions um, on this or any direction and or thoughts that you uh, may have that we could provide forward, I think that would that would be good. Mayor Brzezowski. You know, I, I, I would want to know from you all, and especially from the county, what you recommend. Does it fit into our scope? I mean, I don't want to have to judge these things. You know, I want you all to tell us, does it fit into our, what we're doing, you know, what our mission is? You know, that's what, I, that's what I think you should do. I just don't want to debate whether these are good or not, you know? And I know that we're talk we're maybe gonna talk about some art stuff later. Doesn't answer this question, but I don't know how this fits into that. I would just wanna know if you all feel that they fit into our mission. And if the money's available. I mean, you know, is it available? Do we have it? Okay, well. And you and you recommend it. So Yeah, I I think from the, the money standpoint, is it available? I think the answer would would be uh, yes, but I defer to, to Jim on that. But I'm, I'm I mean, obviously. And is we, this a one-time thing or an so ongoing? You have uh, one of those is uh, I I think they both might be um, one time. Mm -hmm. So one of those happens to do with a, a co-op ad program, and of which you know 
they would go through and uh, take 400,000 and match it with 400,000. Um, or if they get 100,000, they would match it with 100,000. This is a, a, and this is non-reoccurring. Um, there is another one related to the museum itself, which I think is reoccurring. Again, if it's not, Barbara will correct me. And then the other one, it's under general revenue, but I, I truly think it should come under TDT, and that one happens to be around um, a strategic plan for culture, you know, a cultural plan. So in other words, have a roadmap of where we need to go. Which is kind of like what Mayor Welch just would kind of fit into that whole thing. Yeah, and, and that's... And yeah, and that's a TDC, that is a TDC. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Ms. Moore. So as the, the um, representative from the TDC as ex officio on Creative Pinellas and having served in that position, having been on the TDC, off TDC, Creative Pinellas, back and forth, um, and since the inception, really, of Creative Pinellas. So there's been a lot of changes. I think maybe for the, <clears throat> the group overall, understanding that Creative Pinellas is not autonomous, that, that we were put into the role of the funding under Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Um, where it was previously, and, and Mayor, you can kind of help with that in your thought process, <clears throat> the county used to have an arts council, and they funded it uh, back in 2000, well, the early 2000s, uh, to the tune of about uh, three and a half million a year for arts. So without going into all the details as to how and why, here we are over the last several years with very little general fund and supporting the arts through everybody's efforts, all of the departments and um, huge efforts on the part of Creative Pinellas to tie all this to tourism. And as we've seen, the great results, but as this has expanded with so many communities offering so much diversity with all the types of arts and culture. Um, that's where I think that there needs to be the thought of some additional dedicated funding from a source that doesn't have to be constantly justified to tourism. I mean, they, it's like one hand is supporting the other, but it is so important for Pinellas County overall and all of the communities, it's a bigger picture than just the tourism marketing. And if I can also make my comment there too, is that <clears throat> as the CBB, as Visit St. Pete Clearwater has um, worked together over the last couple of years, it's so important that when it's marketing, whether it's advertising, utilize those tools with Creative Pinellas, continue to, to support increased cooperation and, and, and um, working together to, to showcase what we have instead of maybe, and not saying that this is the way it is, I'm saying that, you know, thinking that do we have one area or one department kind of working autonomously when we could be using, better utilizing the tools of Creative Pinellas. So I'm opening the door for the discussion there on how do we get there, these decision packages, and, and maybe that's, you know, from your standpoint, not understanding that um, how it all relates to tourist tax dollars and, and why are we here today in this budget meeting looking at, you know, general fund because sort of Creative Pinellas falls under Visit St. Pete Clearwater, but not directly. <laughs> so it's, it's a gray it was, area. I remember when it was all closed um, or shut down because it was back in the Great Recession. I, I watched all of that go down. So I knew all I'm saying, it's kind of like, um, well, it's, it's how I do anything else. I, I want you to tell me it, it meets the definition and you think we should or shouldn't.
Yeah, I, I would concur, Doreen, your, your memory is right on. I think that the funding level is actually a little higher than that, but it was, yeah, I, um, it was driven by the recession and we were laying off people and it, you know, every local government was taking a hit, but it never really recovered. And so I think it's the perfect time. Let me, in full disclosure, say I'm still on Creative Pinellas. I don't think you've received the resignation letter. There are a couple of um, organizations I have to need to resign from now. But uh, even when the commission was there, it was, you know, questionable whether Creative Pinellas would evolve to the point where it was, you know, the voice for the arts. Uh, Barbara was a big part of that, you know, being successful. But now we're in a point where I think it's perfect time for that strategic discussion about how we fund the arts, how we fund Creative Pinellas, and the other issues we talked about strategically. Um, we've never fully funded it. Um, it was kind of living off of the the, um, the tag revenues. You know, very very low level of funding when we first created it. But you know, I support this level of funding going forward. But we need a a plan going forward for where it fits in. So thank you, Mr. And I, I think that's also where the cultural plan. Yeah. You know, we haven't discussed that in detail, but but it's it's like any sort of whether it's a strategic plan or a, or whatever, you have to have a solid basis, um, and and you know what we have is is far too old, in my opinion, to pick up and come forward and to to do this in a very professional way, so that we have the mm -hmm. plan for the county, and then can Creative Canellas can take and drive that with all of the agencies that are involved and to, um, you know, to mm -hmm. lift all boats. Further questions or comments? Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just go back to uh, Steve, a, a point you made. Um, tell me, um, our interns, where do we find them? Um, more that, well, those that have shown interest in the past have come from USF, but I would also suggest you could go to St. Pete College. Um, there may be other universities. Again, think about the types of positions that we may have. Uh, it may be in marketing. It might be in you know brand engagement. It could be in a variety of different places. So it depends on who has the students who are looking for internships. Mr. Hayes, what are you looking from uh, from this board as far as the decision package reaction? Um, anything more than what you've already got or, or more uh, concrete encouragement or discouragement? Um, I what I took away from that is um, maybe more in-depth conversation. I understand, you know, from making this is really a decision up, up above us. But, you know, again, going through and hearing what you've said in terms of, hey, you know, if you're going to do a plan, what does that outcome look like? Then, so I think maybe some more in-depth conversation. I do know, I, I think that um, they're setting up a meeting with, with, um, with, with Barbara and, and Kevin, our assistant county administrator, to kind of look at what some of those action plans may look like if you're going to move this forward. The cultural plan, as far as strategically, I, I think is important. Um, right, I, I mean, just right off the bat, just because it provides guidance. Um, even in what we're doing, we've got some of that, but we didn't go, this is an in-depth into the cultural side. So I think that's important to have it countywide. So at the end, Barbara's got good direction of saying, you know what, we need to have programs that do this and do this. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of that. Um, you know, and having that come out, out of TDT because at the end there's a lot of that that I think will be important to our business and it'll also help the community um, as a whole. All right. For the comments, conversation? What else do you have, Mr. Hayes? Um, that is it. Yes, that is it. <laughs> Mr. Henderson. Of course, that's not it. <laughs> um, I'm here to help, and I'm not from the government. 
So I'm not as aware of all the costs that are involved in making changes to plans and so forth. <clears throat> um, but it, in moving forward with the beach nourishment topic, uh, since everybody's on board with the idea and, and several think that it may not be enough to go to 1%, the first step I think we need to do is have uh, something sent out to us that gives us a chapter title and verse on how that money is to be used, whether it has to be a match, I don't think it does, uh, so we can understand that better. And also maybe a, a, a recent history of projects that have been done with the cost of those and how much we paid, how much the, the state may have paid and how much the federal government may have paid along with the plan going forward, what's expected in the next couple, three years, or what's in the pipeline already. If we could have that information, that would give everybody you know, a better idea of, of what's going on, what we're doing, what we can do, and then we can have that discussion in, in between May and June, or more discussion. So we, good? Can, we can get that information for you very easily. Yes, ma'am. Thinking back on the decision packages, if I can just take No, we're a done step. talking about that. Okay. Okay. Um, as this goes forward to the BCC, as the conversations take place with administration, creative Pinellas, general funding, TDT monies, and so forth, are they not looking for the Tourist Development Council to kind of give some sort of direction, not necessarily a vote, but some sort of feeling of, yes, you know, we're in support of seeing this, or is it something we should have Barbara, you know, do, do, does anyone else have an interest in having further conversation about that, or do we just let administration and creative Pinellas, Barbara, have those conversations, and then it's kind of, um, amended budgetarily before it's presented to the BCC? How? I would certainly think if you look at the items that are in our packet and there's a specific item or a component or a goal of one of those items that you feel strongly about, I, I think you certainly can share that enthusiasm for whatever portion that is with this council today or with Steve offline or um, uh, with the other commissioners. Um, and I, I think that will be important as we move forward, as we go through our full budget deliberations and we go through these decision packages that get elevated to the BCC. Um, I know the commission will be looking to see what was the enthusiasm level or interest in these subject areas. Okay. I, I can tell you that for me, I was looking for Steve to, I kind of might, might have thought he would have said today how he feels, you know, that he feels that they meet the mission. That's what I was looking for is for him to tell us. I can't tell by reading them whether they fit the mission. I don't know the legal stuff. And I, and, and, you know, you know it's a good idea, Steve, or not a good idea. I mean, I'm just asking, and I, you didn't share it, so I figured you were gonna come back and share it. That's what I was. Mayor Welch. Mr. Chairman, what's the um, calendar for, from here on out? Do we have another cut at this? Do we recommend we have a recommended budget that we vote on at a meeting that goes to the BOCC? So be budget information sessions in June. So we've got, we've got a meeting in May. Um, I, just don't I don't know, I don't remember, does the TDC like do an actual vote on the budget recommendation in this package say yes or no, or is it, I just don't remember how that it part. It could be the plan the past, amendments we, I'm, re I'm remembering. In the past, and Russ would know better, but it seemed like we would we would add a person maybe here, or we would add a program there, and we would it would all be you know balanced against advertising, <laughs> the advertising budget. But do we actually vote on that we versus actually, a plan amendment? Do we actually vote on a budget recommended budget for the? You, you can make a, a motion to vote. But has that been the practice? Correct. Yes. That has been. Okay. And and to correct uh, Phil a little bit is we didn't have a final number on something. That's why we said we were adding this or adjusting, but we were voted on. I thought a total number, and they were going to make the adjustment within on these two little category, two minor categories or whatever, right? And ultimately, it's the BCC's decision anyway. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, but the one recommendation, obviously, from this board is look to bond growth. So we, we will meet again in May. Um, so there's another opportunity uh, we can have on the agenda um, budget deliberation, I guess. We don't, it will obviously won't be this length of time again. Um, but if there's specific items, um, if you let Mr. Hayes know that you had a specific question on or a specific topic that you want, uh, we'll get the sand information out. Um, may I make a request? You may. I want to request that council look at the bed tax relative to the arts and what other communities can doing can do or are doing and tell tell us what is legal to make sure we know what's possible with that. Okay. What other restrictions? What are the DMOs are doing as far as their art spending? So Orange County, for example, funds from their bed tax. And I want to understand what they're able to do with that versus what are we stuck in the marketing lane or do we have more flexibility basically? So that kind of analysis. Yeah, I think those limitations would be in statute regardless of whether it's art or film or sports or whatever. Yeah. So, thank you. Yes, sir. I'd ask that um, uh, Steve looks at the um, sports side a little bit and some of the questions that were brought up and also on uh, uh, amateur sports and, and that study and so that we can kind of know where we're going and whether we need to put something talk about it more for the next meeting or know we have to delay it or whatever. So I think that one, the, the creative and, and the uh, beaches are all items that are important. All right. Last chance. Motion to adjourn. Edgar said we would never get done by two, by the way. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much for a good day's work and your input, uh, uh, your insight on these particular issues are invaluable, so we appreciate that, appreciate your time. We are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.